Currently, we will have a remote webinar. I would like to express gratitude to the Embassy of the Great Britain for their support. This is the webinar which logically completes uh, the project implemented by uh, the uh, partner. Today I will be a moderator of this event and uh, we will try to get used to this new format. Of course, there are certain needs in Ukraine, needs for uh, hospital beds. Uh, however, the topic of uh, gender, topic of domestic violence is still relevant. Let me give you a couple of examples why it is so relevant. For instance, let's take healthcare workers who are at the front line of fighting coronavirus. These are mostly women. Then, some uh, branches, retail, horeca, aviation, sees their activity and uh, most of the staff are women as well and they are now on the unpaid leave. About 40% of uh, catering establishments in Kyiv will never resume their activity after the lockdown. Therefore, the coronavirus and the lockdown affects women significantly. Another problem is public transport. It does not function anymore. In Europe, most women report that this is the only means of transportation for them to go shopping. So again, the women are affected. There is another thing. We stay at home and the workload has increased. The workload in terms of uh, our career as well as our household duties. Or let's imagine that a woman lives uh, with uh, a man prone to domestic violence. So this means that uh, she is even more affected by this violence while staying at home. So today we'll speak about gender equality. We will have the speakers. And now I'd like to pass the floor to Mr. Pavlo Zamostan, who is the deputy head of UNFPA. I would like to express gratitude to the uh, UNPA for promoting the topic of gender equality, for being aware of the social effects of coronavirus spread. Good morning, dear colleagues. Good morning, dear Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, as Marina has said, in spite of uh, such a situation caused by the pandemics, we continue our activity focusing on business being involved in gender sensitive, gender-friendly atmosphere, both at home and at work. And if our colleagues, female colleagues, face with some challenges, we are ready to render assistance. I would like to talk about future of our project. Actually, let me start with some history. We started the project and made a study across uh, Ukrainian companies in order to realize the situation with equal opportunities, attitude toward equal opportunities, corporate practices. We also wanted to study to what extent the gender-based domestic violence penetrates virus uh, different spheres of life. We studied business, we studied domestic situation and in December last year we presented the findings of this study, we arranged the first forum 
Fourteen companies participated in this forum. They joined the declaration which we developed under this initiative. The companies undertook an obligation, so to say, or embarked themselves on studying the opportunities they agreed to check the situation in their companies and verify the opportunity to launch the gender sensitive approaches approaches toward family for instance such approaches might imply better conditions for employees, thus promoting business, helping business develop in a harmonic manner, because those who unfortunately face with domestic violence are affected and need help. This was just the beginning. This meeting confirms the fact that initiative will attract attention of many other companies. First of all, I would like to thank our partners, Ms. Marina, the Center for Corporate Social Responsibility. Together with us, they launched this initiative which is a very promising one. In particular, currently we faced an unexpected yet very tough challenge of coronavirus, which affected all the countries, both wealthy countries and poor countries and developing countries. This challenge affected the countries simultaneously. Then that's why we found ourselves fighting for our values and our lives. This ch challenge affected, of course, both men and women. But importantly, first and foremost, women can be affected who find themselves in difficult life situations. They may have lack of money, they have increased workload, especially those with children. A woman might need to work from home, but she has also to care about her children, and uh, that's also my experience. Then we've got a traditional attitude toward distribution of uh, household duties. A woman in Ukraine usually has to cope with uh, most of the uh, duties at home and she has to care about children. According to our data, if a child is sick, in 40% of cases it is a woman who stays at home with a sick child letting alone other loads and challenges. So, we have developed certain recommendations for business, including 4B model. According to these uh, recommendations, uh, some of the challenges uh, might be addressed, which will have a positive impact on business. The current situation and future challenges will require modernization of approaches toward work and family balance as well as our values. Therefore, I'm sure that today's webinar 
today's meeting will be helpful in this respect. In spite of all the challenges we are facing with currently, we will be able to make progress altogether towards the world of equal opportunities, the world with no place for violence, the world which we would like to have in future and right now. Such a vision is a recipe for success. I am deeply convinced that these approaches will make a platform for sustainable and fastly developing business as well as society. Of course, I can't help but thank our donors, the Embassy of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland for their financial support. Even powerful countries such as the Great Britain are affected by this powerful challenge the casualties are very high and at these times the support of the partners is becoming even more important and we together with our partner promise to do our best to promote uh, the gender equality and equal opportunities for everyone. I wish all of us interesting discussion and interesting presentations. Many thanks to our participants, to our speakers for their commitment, for being with us today and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Pavlo. Pavlo informed you about the first stage and uh, the second stage is just beginning. UNFPA is running currently a very interesting project entitled Dead on Lockdown. We are waiting for your photos demonstrating dads or fathers being busy with kids during the lockdown. And now let me... Uh, tell you a couple of words about housekeeping issues. So we will have several sessions dedicated to gender equality. We will inform you on Ukrainian and European approaches. Then we will talk about the best practices for business about 4B model mentioned by Pavlo. Uh, this is actually an abbreviation. In Ukraine it's 4V. The first is be aware, the second is um, um, bring about response, build effective partnership and be able to measure. We will talk about efficient partnership and we'll talk also about non-discriminative advertising. And finally, we will um, invite new companies joining uh, the gender equality and uh, combating domestic violence convention. Then another important issue, we will have uh, several breaks. You will be able to relax, to drink a cup of tea or coffee and join us again. So this is the time for the first session. It's uh, dedicated to standards of uh, gender equality and uh, national as well as European approaches. I would like to pass the floor to Ms. Katerina Levchenko, who is uh, the government's commissioner on gender policy. Uh, she is uh, a PhD in law. She used to be an MP. She knows a lot about gender equality and combating domestic violence. Uh, she started her career with a very uh, famous CSO, La Strada. Miss Catherine was uh, awarded by uh, the uh, Princess Olga Award of the second and the third grade. Miss Catherine, we are so glad to see you, to have you with us. So please inform us on the Ukrainian approach. Good morning, Miss Marina. Good morning, dear colleagues, participants of this webinar. Indeed, we are 
uh, trying to acquire new approaches under the circumstances of uh, the lockdown and uh, preventive measures. This situation actually is uh, an incentive to develop new competences, especially in terms of ITs, which I guess will be very handy even after the end of these uh, restrictions. Many thanks to the UNFPA for such uh, a stability, for a continuous attention to the gender equality problem and combating domestic violence or speaking broader gender-based violence we enjoy this cooperation between uh, the business between the government and CSOs this cooperation is extremely important and it's the prerequisite for success when we are talking about gender equality, we imply equal opportunities and rights for both men and women in all spheres of social life. Person to the law of Ukraine on equal opportunities for men and women. Legislation of Ukraine in this sphere is quite developed. At the same time, the policy itself is not confined solely to the legislation. The policy is as effective as the legislation is being implemented, implemented by all the actors, uh, both um, government and private sector. Implementation of uh, such a legislation is uh, feasible if uh, there is awareness of gender equality, of its importance, awareness of the fact that gender equality opens broad opportunities for social development and economic development as well, in spite of the fact that gender equality is the value by itself, by virtue. When we are talking about economic sphere and equal opportunities for men and women in terms of economy, first of all, we uh, think about the pay gap present in Ukraine. International organization, the State Statistics Committee and uh, some studies show that uh, the pay gap between men and women is about 25%. This is an essential source of inequality because uh, such a gap implies restrictions for a part of our citizens who are not able to get uh, the decent pay for their work. Of course, there are cultural and uh, economic factors contributing to this situation. Uh, culturally, uh, the pay of women has been lower than uh, that for men. For men, and uh, the women usually and traditionally agree to have lower pay. Uh, women are also eager to uh, have uh, partial employment because uh, of their family duties. The UNFPA implements some approaches as uh, described in the uh, recommendations and the study. Hopefully uh, these uh, approaches will uh, facilitate uh, decreasing the pay gap because this is a negative sign and has its impact on both political and private or family sphere. Let us talk about future plans of Ukraine. Our task is to join the International Equal Pay Coalition. Last year, ILO assessed Ukraine 
in terms of its compliance with the coalition's standards. Uh, they've got 11 criteria and according to the study validated by the trade unions, CISOs and employers and uh, governmental structures, we comply with, uh, comply with seven uh, criteria out of six obligatory criteria to be able to join this coalition and this activity will be continued because there is a need to study and adopt the best international practices and experience. Uh, the Federation of Employers of Ukraine has already joined this coalition and it plans a range of events or interventions which uh, will help understand the tools uh, facilitating the decrease in the pay gap. And as I have mentioned, uh, the uh, reduction of economic inequality definitely will have a positive impact on other spheres. Uh, regarding the gender-based violence or, narrowly speaking, domestic violence, this is uh, also topic of our webinar. No doubt, our population, our society, just like citizens of other countries, are currently in tough situation, which again is related to the restrictions imposed for the time of the lockdown. I'd like to say that the state, the national police continue to address the challenges. There are no changes in activities of uh, law enforcement authorities or Uh, other agencies or the tools which can be used by the police. Yesterday, I, as the government uh, uh, commissioner, uh, had a working meeting. Uh, we invi invited the Minister of Social Policy, the representatives of international uh, organizations, including UNFPA, and we discussed uh, the measures, response measures, which might be implemented today during the lockdown. A part of the institutions started online consultations like a Center for Free of Charge Legal Assistance. They are not going to cease fulfilling their obligations. Ukraine is a country that has joined uh, the CEDO Convention and other international treaties on gender equality. Some conclusions may be drawn by the results of uh, the meetings and consultations. We've had the consultations uh, with the heads of uh, oblast, regional administrations and CSOs. So uh, there is a need to increase the awareness, to raise the awareness, to reach out to uh, the citizens through the shops, through the pharmacies they attend, through the mass media such as TV and radio, because uh, the potential victims cannot use uh, the social networks like Facebook or other vehicles. So the awareness raising uh, should be uh, really important. Then the Center for Family and Youth works actively with families finding themselves in uh, difficult life situations. Together with business structures, uh, this center uh, distributes uh, food packages which uh, reduce uh, the financial burden on families as a result of a temporary loss of employment and other restrictions. 
So just just to help, even in this situation that we have right now, just to help those families and those citizens who do require support and help. So, but we also need to understand that when everything is complete, we will go back. We will return to our life, normal life, ordinary life. Um, which must give us these lessons. So the present day gives us the lessons that we must learn on how to increase the efficiency of our life and how to respond properly, to operate properly with the phenomena and issues in the modern world. So uh, uh, I will be really interested uh, in this webinar in its further stages. So I really want you to have a very productive discussion and uh, with huge interest I will do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You are so calm, Miss Katerina. You know, <laughs> we really feel it. And uh, just tell me, please, three recommendations uh, for us. What do we need to do today what is the, for business for business it's very important today to cooperate with uh, the local self-governance bodies with social services with the centers of social protection and support of children and youth also with uh, uh, the agencies responsible for so other agencies responsible for social support and caregiving agencies and organizations so Thanks to decentralization, we do have different names and titles for all these services and institutions. But the most important thing is to work with those who do have and who are committed and who have the need and who really work to help uh, our citizens. Second recommendation, work with NGOs, with public associations, with activists. And the third, to do everything that we can to decrease the level of violence, to decrease the violence and decrease the stress for their own employees. And to use information, uh, which we do have, because the hotlines, they do work, the call centers work, mobile brigades work. We do all have these data and we want these tools, these means to be used to help people to overcome the stress and pressure. Thank you, Miss Katrina. Thank you so much. We do. Uh, <laughs> you are free right now. <laughs> so you can go. We understand that your working day is... You do still have some work that your working day is still ongoing, but I'd like to thank you so much. And I'd like to say that the study and the surveys, they also confirm that the latest uh, survey tells us that 73% of uh, employees of both genders in the world, they do expect that companies, they expected, the companies are expected to change their HR policies, to be more adapted to life and work balance and so on. And we heard Ukrainian experience, and right now I'd like to pass the floor to Mil Vasilikisainye, uh, who is responsible for gender-based violence prevention, Institute of Gender Equality. So, so she presents Greece. This is the European Institute, and Miss Vasiliki, hi. Отже, пані Васильки, доброго дня. Приємно, що ви з нами сьогодні. І ми дійсно хотіли почути від вас сьогодні, що Європейський Союз робить, якщо ми будемо говорити зараз от про питання про дідів домашнього насильства та, звичайно, гендерна рівність. Ну що ж, дякую, дякую ще. In here, um, I'm going to share with you a presentation uh, on our latest uh, work in gender equality in general, and I will close with uh, our work on intimate partner uh, violence. Uh, let me share with you my presentation. Um, so uh, next, I guess. Uh, first of all, about uh, a few words about European Institute for uh, Gender uh, Equality. Uh, it's an autonomous institute of uh, European uh, Union uh, focused on uh, gender equality and our areas of action is uh, gender equality index, gender mainstreaming, a gender-based violence, gender statistic database, and Beijing uh, platform for action. I'm going to start uh, from our findings in uh, the work field uh, after uh, uh, the latest launch of a gender equality index. Uh, our index, uh, it's a tool that is being uh, developed uh, by uh, AK. It has six main uh, domains, the domain of work, money, knowledge, time, power, and health and two additional domains, the domain of violence and the domain of intersectionality. In, a ninth, in 2019, we found uh, out, according to the data that we have collected, that uh, the score, uh, the average score of gender equality in uh, European Union is still 
white average is only 67.4 and with the lower score in the domain in the area of uh, power with 51.9 and higher score in uh, health uh, with uh, 88.1. Uh, apart from the general uh, scoring, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I am in the, um, I forgot to say next, and I am already uh, in the fifth uh, slide, if that's convenient for uh, the technical support. Uh, so this uh, year, our thematic focus of index was uh, the work-life uh, balance. Uh, which uh, includes uh, six uh, different uh, areas of uh, concern, parental leave uh, policies, informal care of uh, children and uh, child care services, informal care of older people and uh, people with uh, disabilities, uh, transport and uh, public uh, infrastructure, flexible working arrangement and uh, lifelong uh, learning. Uh, next, uh, please. Um, our findings in uh, details. In the case of uh, parental uh, leave, uh, we found out that 30% um, of women and 23% of men uh, aged between uh, 20 and uh, 49 are ineligible for parental uh, leave. And this also uh, connects with uh, unemployment, but also with uh, self-employment. Self-employed employees, it's quite difficult to actually take parental leave that is actually uh, a paid parental leave. Um, relevant to informal uh, children uh, care, uh, we found out that 71.1% uh, 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 among uh, employees are women that actually uh, provide uh, informal care to children and 62.9 uh, only in men. Uh, overall, uh, 56 uh, of uh, women and 51 uh, of men are involved in caring or educating their children or the grandchildren. So we are not only uh, talking about um, parents, but also grandparents. Uh, um, considering older uh, people and the informal care that uh, is provided uh, to them, uh, the majority of uh, informal carers are uh, women, uh, with uh, almost 60%. Uh, percent. And um, we found out uh, that uh, considering the how many uh, days uh, per, uh, they are actually dedicated to provision of informal care, we have uh, 50 percent of uh, women and 10 percent of uh, of men next please we're in the slide seven um, according to lifelong uh, learning uh, which is quite uh, important now uh, if uh, a woman or a man is going to have um, a, a better uh, position in uh, their work environment uh, we found out that only uh, almost 20% uh, of women and 10% of men between 25 and 65, they can participate in lifelong learning. And this is strictly connected to family responsibilities, which in this case might uh, operate as uh, a barrier. And um, it's uh, more difficult for women to participate, almost a double percent, we have 40% of women that are unable to um, participate in lifelong learning procedure because of family responsibilities and 24% of uh, uh, men. Um, according to flexibility at work, at work uh, flexible working uh, hours, um, it's a little bit uh, here, uh, the scoring is a little bit uh, equal, almost equal, because we have 50.3% uh, for uh, women that uh, they're facing um, difficulties in uh, work arrangement. And also it's, uh, it's a little bit, it's close, uh, the, the scoring of men with uh, 54. Uh, the situation is a little bit different in uh, transport. Uh, women are spending less time in commuting every day to their work. And this can be explained because they wanted uh, to be close to, closer to their uh, household. So they are, there is a tendency to select uh, 
places, positions that are jobs, actually jobs or vacancies that they are closest to the household, uh, even if they are facing the cost that these uh, vacancies will be less, uh, uh, less paid, that uh, work, uh, that, that there are vacancies a little bit further from the household, uh, in contrast uh, to men. Um, so why it's uh, important uh, to have a gender equality? We uh, contact uh, how this actually can contribute to uh, the growth, uh, the economic uh, growth. We conducted uh, a uh, study in uh, 2000. Um, I'm sorry, I forget to say next again, we're on the slide eight. Uh, we conducted uh, a study on economic benefits of uh, gender uh, equality, and we found out that if According, of course, to the data, the situation at that uh, period, because now things are might be changed because of uh, what we are facing now uh, globally with uh, the virus. Uh, but apart from that, we found out that if we improve uh, gender equality uh, policies and actually we monitor regular time, we are uh, by the end of uh, 2050. Uh, we might have an increase in the European gross domestic uh, program, uh, product uh, from uh, 6.1 to 9.6%, uh, 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 which means actually which we can translate it from 1.95 trillion to 3.15 uh, uh, trillion. Next, uh, please, we're on the slides uh, 9. Uh, according uh, to uh, economy, to employment, if uh, member states uh, decide and European Union decides to improve and to incorporate uh, gender equality policies in all the fields, we may have an improvement on uh, and we have we are going to have additional um, job uh, positions. Uh, that uh, could reach uh, to the amount of 10.5 million uh, jobs, from which 70% of these jobs would be taken uh, by uh, women. And uh, in this way, we are, we are going to, it's going to, it's going this way, in this way, we are going to contribute to uh, the decrease of uh, pay gap between um, uh, uh, women and men. and in the long run to the decrease of uh, pension gap. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Sorry, we do not have much time, uh, but the ah, okay, okay. I will, so okay, I will be very quick. Uh, that's, that's okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, so now we said uh, the good part, let's see how uh, now uh, gender-based violence cost actually. Next slide, please. It's cost 109 billion euros per year to a European Union, and this cost can be uh, split to lost economic output to provision of services, including health, legal services, social and specialized uh, services, and of course, the personal uh, impact that uh, has uh, to the victim because of the absences and uh, the inability to uh, go to uh, to work. Um, next slide, uh, please. This is here we can see uh, the percentages, uh, the scoring of uh, actually of cost of uh, violence. Uh, but what we can do? Next slide, please. At least at the work environment. At work environment, we can encounter different types of violence. We can encounter the, uh, the violence that uh, takes place in uh, household, the intimate partner violence. A colleague my, of us my other go intimate partner violence, and we may face uh, cases of sexual harassment in the workplace environments. So what we can do in the case of sexual uh, harassment, either as organization or as, as smaller uh, companies, we can issue a regulation, internal regulation about zero tolerance to sexual uh, harassment. And we are con we could take measures to us to ensure that everybody feels safe at the working uh, environment relevant to sexual uh, harassment. Uh, relevant to um, intimate partner uh, violence, at first uh, we can support a colleague that faces 
and then we might uh, contribute to help her to uh, report it or to report uh, us from our uh, actually uh, part. Now in Egi we contacted, uh, we, are on, we have an ongoing um, study about uh, factors that facilitating uh, uh, witnessing and uh, the next uh, step uh, reporting uh, cases of intimate partner violence and one of these areas is actually uh, their work uh, environment. Uh, and I will close with a way that actually we can implement, uh, next please, um, the legislation that is already uh, in, uh, it's already there, a way uh, so as to uh, protect, prevent gender-based violence and in, 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 in a way, in a direct way to um, decrease it and to protect uh, also at the same time victims from uh, it or from secondary uh, victimization. The legislation is there. We have the Victims' Rights Directive, we have the European Protection Order Directive, the Regulation on Mutual Recognition of Protection Measures in the Civil Matter, and now we have Istanbul uh, Convention, at least is legally binding at the European Member States that they have ratified it. European Union is still in the process of assessing it, but still how we can actually implement it. We are, this is an example of how we can implement it. We created uh, the guide for risk assessment and risk management of intimate partner violence uh, for um, police officers, because usually police is the first agency that a woman victim of gender-based violence will address to in order to report a case. In order to uh, help uh, police officers to uh, assess more accurately uh, the risk assessment and to uh, provide uh, and to develop uh, more tailor-made uh, risk management strategies. We, in, by, uh, we did that by proposing four elements, uh, for new elements to be incorporated to the already tools that they are uh, in the field. Uh, or uh, to new, the two tools that they might be developed in the future. These elements is the gender perspective, all tools, they don't have this perspective. The individualized approach, which actually being provided by the Victims' Rights Directive in Article 21, uh, the multi-agents, yes, and I'm, I'm finishing yes. with this. Yes, sorry, uh, we, we really yes. do not have a lot time now, so we should close quite soon. And I would, okay. and because, participants are mostly companies. May I ask you about some recommendations for companies? What to do now in this um, new reality? Yes, uh, first, uh, at first point, uh, companies, uh, they should ensure that um, they can uh, eliminate uh, sexual harassment in their uh, companies, uh, first. And uh, in case of uh, domestic uh, violence, um, there are some uh, discussion uh, maybe uh, by providing special leaves when a, a victim for intimate partner violence, for instance, uh, needs to uh, escape, to flee and to go to protect herself in a shelter. This uh, leave is going to, to be actually kind of uh, justified and not to lose her uh, job. But this is um, uh, a discussion uh, now that uh, we are having, but this it are some kind of uh, ways to, um, to protect uh, the victim, not to lose her job if she's a victim of domestic violence, but also not to uh, in intimate partner violence, basically, and not uh, to uh, lose her job and to lower her productivity because she's a victim of sexual harassment in uh, the workplace. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really important to have a healthy work environment. And one more yes. question. A question. Mm -hmm. um, do European companies pay attention mm -hmm. to topics of gender equality That's actually... and, uh, um, domestic violence? This is actually a very good question. Uh, this we are uh, at least for intimate partner violence. Uh, we are going to figure out uh, after the results of um, uh, after the results of uh, the witnessing uh, study that we have now. But according to sexual harassment, uh, there is an improvement, and at least with um, internal regulations, they are trying uh, to ensure 
big companies that they are showing zero tolerance to uh, sexual harassment because it's also for their benefits and their status to have a healthy work environment and not to have, uh, let's say, complaints and guess them with uh, cases of sexual harassment. Vasiliki, thank you very much. We need to close okay. the session now. And thank you for your presentation. Okay, you. We will among our participant, uh, participants. And okay. it was very to hear your voice, the voice of European uh, Gender Equality Institute and to, to learn more about the index. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, dear participants, dear participants, uh, sorry, there is no sound again. Aha, there is. So, yeah, uh, there was a small delay, but it was really interesting for us to know what Europe is doing. Uh, so, you heard that companies in Europe, they do pay attention to these issues. This is their concern. They mostly speak about sexual violence, intimate partner violence and zero tolerance. You also heard the recommendations from Ms. Katarina Levchenko that companies have to take care of their employees of both, of both genders, so their mental health, of course. And we should take care of you as well. And let's maybe have a small coffee break, <laughs> call it a coffee break. So let's meet. At 11, uh, we'll just shift the time a little bit, but I do think that we catch it up. Okay, so have a nice and pleasant coffee break. Let's have some more videos from UNFPA and for Hans Happiness. Thank you. So this happens. So if he hits you, it means he loves you. So Olga, why are you crying? You sim he simply likes you, that's all. So stop lying. You have to be at home right after work. You're doing it intentionally. So if you don't shut up, you'll have problems. This is not my stuff to deal with. Where have you been? Where is your money? Where's your pension? Give it back to me. So he hits you means he loves you. So you are, you are the one to blame. This is not my business. And I hate you. Break the violence circle. So super dad can do everything and we do even have the diaper rules or the panties rules to protect children from the sexual violence. So your children are very small right now still, but do you actually talk with them about security and safety are there any safety rules that we can give to small kids so we do not allow uh to touch the genitals uh their hands at the daytime so the only the only time simply it's allowed to after the bathroom after these washing procedures when we use creams and other personal care stuff so you know nose drops in some situations when they are in the children's room on the sofa together so we trust them <laughs> and this like a small evening ritual then they actually when they have clean hands it happens when they study it we don't uh, prohibit that but with other people how to behave how to communicate with foreign uh, with uh, people they don't know so with foreigners with people who come from different places so some dangerous touches we didn't have these situations so our children are very open but the thing is that they have never been alone without us, without our care, our protection, without our surveillance, let's say. So grandmother, grandfather, us, kindergarten teachers or nanny. So total control, the territory is protected in the kindergarten. So we are absolutely sure that nothing may happen. No strange people may come and uh, actually start behaving inappropriately with our children. So we're sure of that. But of course, if it's if the school starts and we'll have this small commuting piece through the park to the transport when it starts, you know, we'll start talking about safety issues uh, because children will meet new people, strange people. Some people may just pass by. Some may have very cruel intentions. We need to tell that to them. Sometimes the people who really want to use a child uh, because uh, they are, let's say, perverts, they can pretend to be very gentle, very interested. They 
put on these masks, they try to communicate in such a way that children simply do not recognize it. But if a child knows exactly what the barrier is, like if the child knows this is fully prohibited, I'll be punished for talking to strange people, to foreigners, mm, the child will simply be afraid to use this kind of communication in any case. So I'll tell you now... Uh, uh, viewers about the safety rules adopted by the Council of Europe and uh, for so many years they're there, the panties rules they call it, or the underwear rules and these rules should be given to children starting from even to toddlers, three, f two or three years old, even the uh, preschool age five very simple rules are there which are really cool and it would be really great for each child to know that in Europe this is delivered by teachers in kindergartens. Unfortunately, in Ukraine, not all kindergartens, they do speak about these rules, but parents can do that. In kindergarten, in grandmothers, grandfathers can do that. Everybody who knows that first rule is that your body belongs only to you. This is your property and no one is actually allowed to touch it without your permission. So we even say that mother and father cannot simply, uh, you know, look at your genitals without your permission so maybe if there is some health issue if there is a rash so parents still need to ask for permission they tell like okay we just will do that simply because we are worried maybe we need to go to doctor and give you some treatment but still they always ask and the child says yes if child says no of course uh, in an hour or two we again need to ask a child but no one forces child to do that second rule is that uh, we have safe touch and unsafe touch. Safe touch is about what? So basically the parents and other adults, they ask, can I hug you? Can I give you a hug? Can I take your hand? I'd like maybe to uh, sit with you, watch a cartoon together with you on this couch. So unsafe touch is when a child says, no, I don't want to give you a hug. I don't want you to touch me. This is something I really don't want. But the person is still doing that. So even child's no is ignored this is absolutely an unsafe touch and quite often unfortunately our relatives uh, that do visit our small kids they start hugging them and kissing and then they really want to do that because small children look very nice you know and cute but if we force a child to give a hug we simply show that we are the authority we are stronger you shouldn't do that so if a strong adult hugs you it's a clear message that, okay, you don't have a right uh, to say no. So this is all about safety. We need to talk about this. And uh, truly, it's really cool when parents see the child is not in a mood to give a hug, you know, not in a mood to kiss a contact. Okay, no force, no forced action. So just verbally, I miss you so much, you know. I really would like to give you a small hug to stay with you right now. When you're in the mood, please do come to my room, do come to the kitchen and we'll do that. And uh, I guarantee you that the child will be in the mood. This is really very important. Third rule is about secrets, good and bad secrets. Because those people who use children, perverts, pedophiles, they do everything for the child to keep silence forever. And of course, to keep that away from parents. They may intimidate the child. Never tell about this to your parents and explain your children. Please tell me everything. Tell grandmothers, grandfathers everything. Teachers, if something happens, tell it. Tell someone you trust if this person is next to you. A good secret is when someone has a birthday and we bought a present and this is a big secret and you need to, <laughs> to, to keep silence for two weeks but of course you want to tell about this present but no. Good secrets is something that gives positive, nice emotions when you want to share. Bad secrets, it's when you want to keep silence about something that gives you negative emotions. So, fourth and fifth rule. Fourth rule is that responsibility is always with the adults. What they do with children is their responsibility. It's about them. Children are never responsible for the actions of adults, for these issues, because adults can easily manipulate children, force children to do something, and they also blame children. You wanted that, you provoke me, you know, all these things. So please, we need to talk about that. Fifth rule. It's not uh, 
a problem to start talking about it. It's a good way when you discuss it to ask for help. Don't be shy to ask for help. Relatives, we as adults, we ask help from our friends, psychotherapists. So we need to promote our children, to stimulate our children. We need to say that we are your friends and please, we will always support you. So come and ask for help. Very simple five rules that do protect children from sexual violence and they do work. And this is really great that we have these. Uh, so actually, all the rules, great, except one. When I walk just in the street, especially, you know, when children start like, <laughs> when when I see that children do not listen to me, I just use this, you know, very specific words, uh, give me your hand right now. When we to cross the street, say, give me your hand. I'm not asking. I'm actually stating, give me your hand right now. So they know that if a father goes or we both with my wife goes, so just give me your hand. And my son Marco likes like to, ah, Leave your hand and run somewhere, you know, in the park. So this is it. If he sees a mushroom, he's there. So in the street, of course, uh, everything's very strict. Yes, this is this is this is correct because if a children uh, if children try to do some uh, very dangerous things, we do not need to ask. The first priority, the priority for us is to think about the safety and security, and just to uh, not ask, but be very persuasive. Hello once again, welcome back to our webinar, to this second session. Actually, I'm not sure whether you managed to drink any coffee because at these uh, videos were very informative and interesting. Thank you, UNFPA, for raising awareness. We would like to make our webinar as interactive as possible. We've got two streams on Facebook and YouTube. Please ask your questions, especially now during this session. The representatives of business uh, will join us and tell about uh, their interventions. Then, uh, secondly, you may follow uh, the link to our webinar in your social networks. As many companies uh, as possible in Ukraine should be able to watch these webinars. The companies will talk now about their practices and would like to learn more about uh, the entire project running since the previous year. So, with great pleasure, I'd like to pass the floor to Ms. Svetlana Pavlish, who is the UNFPA consultant. She's an expert in domestic violence. She used to be national coordinator of a Council of Europe project dealing with Istanbul Convention. It has already been mentioned here. Hopefully, Svetlana will tell us more about the declaration mentioned by Pavlo and about uh, the study, about our guidelines, 4B guidelines. We will discuss uh, these guidelines during this session in more detail. And, of course, she will inform us on uh, the seminars 
workshops which uh, the UNFPA arranged for a business. This workshop, with these workshops, gained a very positive feedback. Feedback. Now I can see Svetlana. We are so pleased to see you. Please tell us more about the project. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm glad to welcome you at this webinar. Thank you for being able to join in this tough period for Ukraine. We have to adapt to the new circumstances very promptly. A couple words about our project. The slides, please. As Pavlo Zamostan said, this project started as a study. You see the uh, QR code to download this study on the screen. What was it about? Let me tell you a couple of words about the methodology. About a thousand respondents took part in this study from 79 companies. This was a remote study, so a slight error is possible. At the same time, we can talk about useful information for the development of guidelines and for the activities. So what are the figures? What we didn't know about the domestic violence and gender equality. So we learned that some companies do not have uh, um, any family-friendly policies. 76% of respondents informed us about that. Then uh, a number of uh, companies uh, said that they need such actions to strike a balance between work and family. Unfortunately, a small number of respondents said that they were aware about certain policies in their companies. Just 3% mentioned that they know about the code of ethics. 5% mentioned that they know about their companies implementing uh, the policies to prevent discrimination. Not too many know about uh, the steps their companies make to provide gender equality. Only 5% of employees know about uh, the uh, terms of child care leaves. Uh, this statistics is related to the fact that uh, people just do not know about uh, the opportunity granted by the state policy for dads to get the child care leave. Uh, the Actually, uh, this uh, paid or unpaid leaves is a good time, a good period for dad to spend more time with the newborn and help the wife. About 20% of uh, respondents faced with uh, uh, gender-based discrimination. About 10% uh, 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 of people faced with doubts about uh, the professional competence. Uh, then we asked also our respondents about uh, the sexual harassment at workplace. We asked uh, the mostly uh, the office workers. We didn't include the plants and uh, the branches of uh, manufacturing entities. However, we can uh, also uh, use this information for assessing uh, this amount. 4% of uh, employees refuse to answer this question. 24% uh, of people acknowledged being harassed at the working place and 81% of them were women. 41% of uh, respondents, about a half of the staff, uh, saw the signs of domestic violence borne by their colleagues. So they see that this phenomenon is of a latent nature. Not everyone is ready to acknowledge being a victim. What's the impact of the domestic violence on the work of companies and uh, the employees themselves? So this, uh, the 50% said that uh, this has an impact on uh, their health, on their mood, and 50% said that they are not able to concentrate on work. And this has an impact not only on their work, but also the work of their colleagues, because a uh, part of their work should be done by their colleagues. The perpetrators may call, may uh, 
pay visits to work and uh, the colleagues uh, should undertake the responsibility to answer these calls sometimes. Let me draw attention to another figure, one further the case of domestic violence uh, took place at work. In what way? The perpetrator came to the workplace, threatened, sent some threatening messages, made threatening calls. 2% of respondents were affected by such calls if they tried to help the colleague or assist somehow in this situation. So what did we learn about the impact uh, of uh, these events on the employees? 78%, which, quite, which is quite a significant number, say that uh, the uh, domestic violence has a negative impact on the occupation, on the professional life. And 49% of the employees say that they do need uh, the certain policies. Let me quote a couple of figures uh, which are quite demonstrative. What is uh, the cost of domestic violence? Uh, first, uh, 600 women uh, perish annually from domestic violence. If we compare this to military hostilities, we get uh, the number of 174 uh, casualties. There is not a single person which is uh, warranted against uh, the domestic violence. Uh, the uh, domestic violence costs 2.4 million USD annually for Ukraine. Actually, this is the budget of entire of entire oblast of entire region. Uh, 3.5 thousand sick leaves should be issued annually for the victims. Uh, why am I talking about these figures? They might sound a bit abstract, but every figure and uh, every dollar implies our taxes, taxes we pay for the law enforcement authorities, for health workers. Uh, the more uh, events, the more cases happen, the more taxes we have to pay to cut them. Realizing all this, companies decided that they may establish a kind of coalition to protect their employees and show by their own example what steps can be made in this direction. In December 2019, a forum took place and during this forum, 14 companies joined this Free companies to business association joined uh, this declaration. So on the screen you see the text of the declaration both in Ukrainian and in English. On the right you see the QR code. You can follow it and download the declaration. If you've got any questions, if you are willing to join the declaration, it's possible to sign and send a scanned copy of the declaration to the UNFPA. And now let me dwell on the declaration itself, on its provisions. The declaration itself is aimed at assisting the state in achieving SDGs, in particular SDG 5 and SDG 8. This declaration is constituted by uh, three sections. So the first, implementation of family-friendly and uh, gender-friendly base uh, policies, uh, then zero tolerance to domestic violence and establishment of partnerships. Talking about the first direction, first section, we can say that this implies a review of existing of existing programs, their enhancement or perhaps adaption implementation of other practices. This also means uh, the gender sensitive language during the workflow. In the documents uh, we may many times see that um, only uh, nomina of um, uh, typical for, uh, for men are used. Then uh, these uh, steps are not mandatory, they are just recommendations proved by the practice. The second direction is uh, combating domestic violence. Uh, this direction 
involves uh, some uh, um, awareness raising, perhaps some trainings for the staff. The third direction is efficient and effective partnerships. And this direction uh, implies participation of uh, uh, participation in public campaigns. One of them is uh, 16 days of active combating gender and domestic violence. Uh, the uh, public campaigns took place during these days and the uh, UNFPA offers a certain concept of such campaigns illustrating some practices adopted by other companies. Then this direction also involves cooperation with the suppliers, uh, with the community. We got a very good figure, 35% uh, Seventy-five percent of people trust their company, uh, thinking that it can change life for better. This is a big credit of trust. Uh, not always such figures become known. The uh, public authorities of CSOs uh, seldomly have such a credit of trust, and I think that the companies have to um, have to be in line with this trust. The declaration was signed by 12 companies and two business associations, Energoatom, IT Integrator, Lviv Business School, uh, Metro Cash and Carry, Teva Ukraine, the pharmaceutical company, Avon Ukraine, Corteva AgriScience, Ernst and Young, then MetLife, an insurance company, then Nestle, Laurel, Records Group, Starlight Media. Some of the representatives of these companies will join us today talking about their practices. And uh, we've got some other candidates, some other potential signees. We will learn more about them a bit later. Now, a couple of words about... A couple of words about implementation of this declaration. There are some good words, but uh, what practical steps can be made? Now, on the screen, you see the cover sheet of guidelines of a manual for business developed on the, the basis of the study I've mentioned. You can download this manual by the QR code on the screen. It, this manual describes the 4B model. We have mentioned it today as well. Now, you see it on the screen. It's uh, constituted by four stages. Each of the stages has its own purposes and own steps. Uh, in more detail, they are described in the manual. Let me briefly dwell on some of them. The first is be aware. The first stage is be aware. The company should become aware of the stage it is in now in terms of combating domestic violence and implementation of uh, gender policies. At this stage, the company may establish a working group, uh, assess the baseline, collect the statistic data. It may ask some outsource assistance from experts, from advisors, just to start. The second stage is a response, provide a response. What does it mean? It means to review the policies or develop new ones. It has been already mentioned that uh, the risk assessment is essential because uh, not only victims but also perpetrators work in the same company. Therefore, the risk assessment is very important and the priority should lie with the victim. This is both international and Ukrainian approach, which uh, is uh, anchored in the state policies and legislation. Then the third stage is efficient partnership development. Such partnership may imply joint projects with the CISOs, with international organizations. For instance, our project together with the UNFPA. Such projects were implemented by L'Oreal together with UNFPA as well. There are some international organizations or UN agencies like ILO, which also run their own projects. So recently, they adopted a new convention um, establishing new standards for companies in terms of a working place arrangement. At this uh, convention is relevant for us in terms of coronavirus. 
I'm sorry, I have to inform you that we are running out of time. I will have to give you some signals. Okay, let me summarize. You know, this is my favorite topic. I got fascinated by it. Let's scroll a couple of, of uh, slides. Let's get back to the slides. The next slide, please. So, how can we profit? How can the companies profit from these uh, policies? First, improved image. It's not enough just to say that I'm the best company on the market, just come to me. The candidates uh, can also select the companies by certain criteria, uh, judging whether it will be comfortable working this or that company. Then uh, there is also a financial component of such activities. Every dollar invested in psychological health of uh, the employees can a result in nine dollars in future every dollar invested in company uh, domestic violence can save from five to 25 usd then i will tell you a little bit more about the concept for business uh, we will be able to share this concept with all of you after the webinar we will uh, distribute the links to google drive to the materials and the presentations the unfpa developed the awareness raising materials for the companies to publish them on their web resources uh, there were also some consultations and uh, meetings with the companies for them to promote uh, the policies and their implementation now you see the picture taken at our workshops there were several of them uh, to the final workshop took place uh, as a webinar uh, we discussed this for b model we discussed the implementation of this model in the corporate corporate policy and we shared our practices at the moment you see again two QR codes, two links to the manual and to the study. That's all from my part, actually. I would like to call upon you, asking you to read this publication, just for you to understand what is gender policy, what is domestic violence, and how it can be combated. I would like to thank uh, the organizers for such an event, for the development of these recommendations, and also, I'm urging the companies who haven't joined yet to assess uh, this uh, manual to study the opportunity to, of joining this important initiative. Svetlana, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very useful and uh, you've provided some information. So, we right now come from Svetlana to companies' practices. So the first speaker I'd like to invite is Mikhaila Kurikalov, consultant of UN, uh, UNFPA. So Mikhailo is actually already an expert of gender equality. He is a PhD in politics, an expert. And Mikhailo once was leader uh, of one of the projects that was aimed to return the parents back to work. So. <laughs> He'll tell us about gender audit right now. And this is the first step. The first step to for the company to be capable of doing something uh, if it comes to gender equality. So the first step must be taken our, within the framework of our 4B model. So first of all, to recognize that there is something wrong. So, and uh, right now we come to Mihaila. Thank you. Thank you so much. So actually, I'll tell you not just about the audit, Good morning, first of all, good afternoon. Not just about the audit, but also about the advantages of the gender approaches presentation that you mentioned. So with the references to surveys, with the figures, I'll try to use 10 minutes for that. So these advantages are quantified already, are measured. They're presented in figures and they also based on audits as well conducted by different companies within different surveys and different uh, enterprises and companies in different states. So the next slide, Le please, uh, 10 minutes, please, 10 minutes. 
more or less for the question and answer session just a couple of minutes more okay okay so i'll try to handle now look uh so the basic idea is that gender is the word that means that 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 has a certain meaning that we put into it may be absolutely empty and it may mean something very specific so this is a container we fill in with a business in the case of business we fill it with the idea of how can the gender equality tools be used for the company's profit actually to get, gain more money to increase to increase its coverage in the market its presence in the market and so on so we do not talk about some things so it's not just about the profit and we just don't say that the company is committed to do something for the SDGs or certain other achievements. Of course, we'd really like companies to think more about SDGs, but if they don't think about SDGs so much, this is okay. If they don't want to save the world, well, <laughs> basically this is the reality. But some of these tools can be used actually for the aims that business defines as the priorities. So the next slide. So. So we defined a couple of these tools, you can see them. So let's take it as tools, okay? Uh, not like requirements, not like something you need to sign, you know, not, not sign um, and take as a commitment. So if a company simply understands that this works for a context, then okay. So first of all, of course, there must be a survey to analyze the situation but all the tools that are related somehow to gender equality they all are here you can see that we have don't have the word gender actually there is no sense to tie it so much to the gender itself it's just a way to look at it it's just like a, just like goggles or glasses that we can use as lens to look through uh, to look at communication through it uh, for example and understand how can can we improve the communication first of all and other things of course the policies, family-friendly policies, so for employees with families to feel okay working. Now, more women in decision-making. Of course, sometimes we may have more men in that process, but of course we need to achieve that. So equal pay, communication, advertising, that sexism and discrimination mechanism to prevent and eliminate discrimination and harassment. Sixth one is concluding action plans, coordination, monitoring, data collection. So coordination, monitoring, data collection is easy for Ukraine, I guess, is the most appropriate. But so we have a lot of surveys, but still not enough data anyway, because uh, surveys do not always give the answer to question, how did this specific tool impact this specific situation? Did any other factor impact it? So we cannot say whether this tool specifically impacted something. Of course, we need to develop certain methodology aimed to evaluate this specific situation a concept. So let's change the slide and let's go on. And let's go on again. So the first tool is, let's say, it's the most popular one and I think it's the easiest to be used. Uh, so family friendly policies, we call it. So we can actually, they have different manifestations like the flexible schedule, remote work, so parental leave for dads, medical insurance, also sick leaves for dads or children, so different type of care, different uh, types of uh, childcare. For example, a company may launch its own kindergarten, uh, a certain, you know, clubs. So family events and the last thing is the programs to support employees who return to work after the parental leave so we defined it to be one of the most interesting options it's this topic is really interesting during the last two seminars we define that companies are ready to do that many do ready and the next slide please so here we talk but how Ukrainians as employees, so your employees, how important this thing is for them. So family friendly policy in the companies is important to people. And the statistics says us that only 2% of men, they uh, go to sick leave when their children, 
when the children are sick. So, uh, forty-four percent of women. So this is quite troubling. This is quite troubling. Quite a troubling statistics, and we again expect that nothing will change dramatically that fast. So, if we had a situation, a fifty-fifty situation, we would not have these precautions, gender-based precautions. So this is a matter of concern. And the next slide, please. Next, please. Yeah. Aha, the welcome back kit. This exactly is about what we decided for the last time to call these welcome back kits, business associations. So how to help the employees to adapt to, let's say, the new corporate reality. So we have uh, the so-called freshman kit <laughs> when people only come to work. And the welcome back kit is, for example, when a person is absent for two or three years, a mother or a father, something changes in the legislation that regulates it, new practices appear, something changes. And uh, for the person, it's really important to dive quickly into that and to adapt quickly. So temporary mentorship trainings, uh, for example, not working uh, for a whole day, but with a flexible or part-time schedule for a couple of months. So it depends on how ready you are as an employee in the company, how ready you are to adapt and how quickly. So it depends on the employer as well. If you're ready to provide that so so not so many surveys are there it's really hard to determine it's really hard to determine how the friendly family policy really affects the economic growth economic profit some surveys uh tell us still that uh it affects companies positively 0.6% per year during five years, that was, was noticed. 158 companies that actually stated that, that took part in the survey. And a uh, certain positive impact on profitability of the company. Within five years, uh, annual growth was 0.4%. So not quite substantial, but this is just one of the experts of the gender policy. So if you use other tools, this is only one of the tools. But uh, again, this is about growth, not about decrees. So it's quite optimistic. So women in decision making or women in leadership positions. So this is important for many companies. So it's important. To know, do we have women as managers, as leaders, especially for job seekers, women job seekers? In Ukraine, this question was not asked that directly. But uh, in some surveys... Within some surveys, we can see that quite high percent of women, they do take this into account. It's very important for them. So it actually depends on which vacancies they would select. So we can see uh, that the attractiveness of the company depends on that. Are there women at the top management level or not? So some companies, they do take specific measures to reach that. For example... Bloomberg media company tries to have women uh, attempts to have women in all the units in all the sections. Duolingo tries to reach this 50-50 proportion and they um, fund certain events for women and they have special headhunters for women only let's say so they try to attract more women so the experience of the company the company's products of course of course uh, they try to stick to women's preferences of course when designing new products for example advantages it's about the advantages for for the company's profitability and productivity So within five years, we've had this survey ongoing, 617 biggest companies in the world. And uh, they determined, the experts determined that those companies were, we have, well, we have more than four women in the directors' boards. It means that the more women we have, the higher productivity will be. And of course, the fewer women we do have in these boards, well, it means that profit goes down. We take the average market. 
figures, of course, from one to three women gives half a percent of growth. One woman in a board gives a little bit more than 0.5% of growth. And actually the proportion is that. So what are the advantages? So apart from those that I've already uh, mentioned, which can be quantified, also the advantages that women and men do better recognize what they can do in the company, how can they promote themselves, how can they develop their career. They are highly motivated. Of course, talented people are involved and different styles of management we use with different needs, motivation factors and potential of employees of both sexes. And of course, we speak about consumers, they're easily attracted. So equal pay, this is a complicated issue. It doesn't mean that everybody has to get the very same amount of money. Uh, so we simply need to ensure that people who are in the same positions, in equal positions, they do have the same salary. That's enough. That's the first step that should be taken. So, so ILO Convention 100 on equal reimbursement for men and women for the equal work, for equal labor, adopted in 1951. So uh, within this document, you can actually... Uh, find certain provisions, certain ideas on how to define uh, how we can reach this equality. So how can we actually define whether the labor is equal or not? So certain qualifications, amount of hours that were spent at work, the experience, of course, the knowledge that are required for that kind of position, and many other factors. In Ukraine, what we have with a salary gap Sorry, gender gap, 24, 26% depending on the position, but many companies do say that, okay, men and women in our companies at equal positions do get equal payment. So some companies, they take specific measures to ensure that their employees get equal pay for equal labor, for equal activity. So Salesforce, invested $6 million to equalize this process. And Nike once had this lawsuit, you know, filed lawsuit on sexual harassment filed to the court and they launched a mechanism on the on their practices and regulations revision. And for 7,000 employees, they changed the payment mechanism mostly for women. Then what we have So people become more motivated, employees become more motivated, they feel valued, uh, they, they feel that they have certain value and we can involve more talented people when they feel safe like employees. So the fourth instrument, the fourth tool is to ensure that communication advertising uh, is fully deprived of sexism and discrimination. For com consumers this becomes more and more important. In Ukraine we don't have the data still but we have this tr these trends that we trace in social media as well, and we can see that quite often consumers and clients, not just gender experts, but just average people, different people, they pay attention to sexist advertising and they do express their opinions because there is certain impact and they even can stop buying, purchasing certain products. So it definitely... Uh, it's definitely important, of course, if you want to improve your uh, relations with international partners, national business partners, that's important. How to use this tool, how to implement this tool. So involving women to development of advertising and marketing strategies, involving women as experts and speakers. Check if the standards are not violated. So Mihaila will have a separate session about non-discriminatory advertising. Uh, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. So we don't have enough time for that. We have four speakers and I really want everyone to express. So please, Mihailo, let's get, draw the line. Okay. So good. The last two slides, we'll skip them and uh, let's come to the fifth one. Mechanism to prevent and combat discrimination and harassment. One of the tools that a company can use to create such a mechanism. 
what is the uh, advantage? More comfortable and convenient working environment. Fewer, uh, fewer, fewer reasons are there to file lawsuits against the company. Not enough data from Ukrainian companies, but we can we expect that if in other countries uh, we have this wave emerging, it will come to us eventually. So sixth one, action plan. Mm -hmm. Action plan that stipulates. So launching the working group. So you need to determine who will be the res who will be responsible for that in the company. So a working group is a perfect option because then you'll have multiple perspectives and one focal point is there, as we know, one person. For example, an HR section or HR unit, people can be involved from it. So gender audit or simply to assess the situation. So gender audit is quite a global thing itself because it within the framework of the audit, we need to evaluate everything that somehow relates to gender within the company. Uh, evaluate how many men and women we do actually have on the company in different positions, executives and mid-level and decision makers and heads of units, heads of sections, heads of departments and the director's board. Then, uh, a little bit even more complicated thing. How employees do, uh, what is their attitude to gender issues? Uh, do they actually recognize that this is quite a hot issue? Do they recognize the importance of that? Do they recognize that there is certain impact on their responsibilities and on their work as well, on their activity? So with these five tools that I've presented earlier, so basically this is the basis for the analysis or the audit. Actually, and we need to understand whether the company actually complies to these parameters. And that's how, after this assessment, uh, we actually will get this more or less full picture that will show us what the company can change and revise and uh, whether these changes will be useful in the context of personnel's motivation or profitability, productivity, market positioning uh, or even a combination of contextual factors. So gender audit usually is completed that with the use of its results, we define what to do, what to do in a different way, first of all. What do we need to do in a different way? Because it's, everything is good, we don't need to change anything. <laughs> so we simply need to think if something requires change, if we detect certain problems, what is there? What is the potential for these changes? Is it there? We need to know. In the process of the action plan implementation, it's important to monitor and collect data uh, for the company and if the company is ready to share the data with partners and other companies uh, for example certain sensitive issues for the company may be detected but this is very important because it allows to answer the question why do we need it if we talk about the advantages of gender equality for the companies uh, in in abstract words and general words without figures it may affect us but it not affect actually the decision makers because decision makers prefer figures they prefer quantifiable <laughs> uh, certain quantifiable uh, data so the more information we do have the more data we have uh, from Ukrainian companies uh, it's highly likely that certain decisions will be made actually to implement these gender-based approaches. Mihailo, yes, Mihailo. I'm so sorry, but we are out of time extremely and we do have questions to you. So the question and maybe one minute to complete, okay, to finish. So about the gender, if a company decides to launch an audit, which parameters are the ones that company should look at? Okay, so first parameter is uh, is how exactly how exactly the company launches the policy 
uh, the family friendly policies how do they launch them how do they develop these this is the first parameter because um, this is really very important for many companies regardless of the area the company is working in uh, so among the employees you definitely have people with families among your employees and this fact that they have families affects the way they perform their duties positively negatively we don't know but it affects so if we define how the company presents these policies and implements it so uh, if there is certain impact impact or other policies if we define how the company implements it how people are satisfied with these policies and with the mechanism of its implementation whether people actually need these policies to be there uh, then we'll understand better the company will understand better what they should do next parameter is communication how exactly internal external communication of the company how exactly the gender aspects are taken into account is there a situation maybe when company in its advertising in its commercials they use stereotypes for example if yes mm, if yes if it does use stereotypes uh, so again we need to stick to the data resulting from the surveys last time within the seminar we determined that pharmaceutical companies quite often use results of the surveys that money usually that the sorry women usually make decisions on medicines and on treatments so men are <laughs> uh, eliminated from that process uh, okay so the survey tells that yes women do but on the other hand can we actually target certain advertising campaigns at men? Yeah, Mikhaila, I offer to stop at this very moment. Pharmaceutical companies get the task to check it and start thinking what men really want to do. Do they really want to make decisions? Thank you so much. So we're out of time completely. And uh, I want everyone, I want really everyone. We, we must stick to gender equality anyway. So thank you, Mikhaila. Thank you. So really useful. So, the previous speaker informed us on the main aspects and main parameters. Now, I would like to pass the floor to Ms. Yana Goncharenko, the sustainability lead at Starlight Media Company. Since this year, Yana has been uh, the lead of uh, this separate direction, sustainability. Until that, uh, she worked in the communication unit and she also dealt with a women empowerment principle, which she implemented in the company. She focuses on uh, the SDGs and one of them is SDG number five, gender equality. Ms. Honcharenko, the floor is yours, but please uh, stick to the timelines. Dear colleagues, welcome everyone. Indeed, I represent the company of St uh, the company Starlight Media, which produces uh, content for uh, TV uh, and uh, digital platforms. Let me inform you on uh, the tools and insights we've got in the, our company. So our path can be split into five steps. So all of them are related to 4B model. But prior to talking about each of these steps, I would like to uh, let you know about a mandatory step. Uh, this is uh, this, the dialogue with CISOs because uh, the involvement of CISOs may facilitate integration of the company into uh, the sustainability process. So we are trying to interpret or to translate uh, the SDGs into the language of business. It is uh, very important for us uh, that the gender equality can be measured in monetary terms on a quarter year basis so the gender value is a value it's important for companies today and forever 
we at the Starlight Media are privileged to participate in multiple uh, gender equality movements or feminist movements from the very beginning. Uh, the uh, C uh, CEO of our company was the champion of this process, actually. Uh, the global transformation process started in our company. It aimed at the strong corporate culture. It was very crucial for us to have the corporate culture in line with the current challenges and future challenges. The gender equality and inclusiveness is one of the indicators by which the corporate culture can be measured. So now let's talk about the steps of gender audit. We used the uh, perhaps uh, the, uh, the tools developed by the uh, women's organization. It's very useful. Even if you think, if you believe that you've got all the competences and know the bias line of your company, this tool will enable you to cast a side glance on your uh, experience, on your situation. Uh, as a result of this analysis of this test, you will learn about uh, the situation in which your company is now. So uh, there is a 100 point scale. The first question actually asked in Ukrainian context is, wow, is there any problem indeed? So the use of this tool may demonstrate uh, the presence of the problem. So the second step is action plan. What to do? When can we do it? We at Starlight Media decided to use the global practices to adopt global approaches and we were the first company to join the women empowerment principles. Uh, these principles were developed again by the UNO for businesses that are willing to integrate gender equality principles into the companies activities. So this is a kind of a guide and uh, it's an opportunity to learn about uh, the best practices. So we signed uh, these principles and made a commitment. The commitment might be both public and internal. Uh, the public commitment means that uh, this is a point of no return to the previous condition because you make a public promise, so to say. And internally, uh, this gives an impetus to all the employees of the company and thus you may involve all people who are not indifferent to the topic. So this was the action plan by Starlight Media. These are 10 improvements which we planned for the first year after joining uh, the principles. Maybe not all the processes uh, can be described in short, but to put it briefly, uh, we focus on all possible aspects of the workflow and job descriptions, review of job descriptions, and most of these tasks, these 10 tasks, have been completed or at least uh, big progress was achieved. Uh, for instance, uh, the program for parents, uh, which focuses on the dads who are willing to spend time uh, spend more time with their family with their kids. We cooperate with our suppliers, with our partners, and uh, we check how many of our suppliers of our business are headed by women. And another topic, which is, of course, very important for us, which leaves lots of space for improvement, is the topic of our content, well, for the content we produce. So we communicate with our creative teams and with our spectators. Of course, we're not going to be confined to these uh, 10 tasks or 10 obligations. There were several activities like uh, changing signs 
on the doors using the feminatives or we used feminative forms on uh, the uh, certificates and um, passes. Every company uh, should explain the employees why it is so important. Uh, the employees uh, are willing to see that the company shares this value. Such communication is a must because anyway, there are lots of challenges. So we, like other businesses, are still learning and no plan can be a warranty. Uh, currently there is a coronavirus pandemic and you have to uh, respond. Children are at home and uh, Starlight Media is trying to implement principles allowing the parents to work remotely and in our internal communications we urge our employees to distribute their uh, household duties. Then another uh, another step is uh, uh, the establishment of sustainability lead. I'm the head of this sustainability at our company, and the team advocates. This is a wonderful job. I work mostly with the gender equality and the SDGs, which is no less important. Here on this slide, you see uh, the term topic advocates so we see them as uh, the champions of the process so we are privileged uh, uh, the president of the group the human capital function the communication department are our reliable partners it's very cool when people from different units or subsections join the process it's a big business and it is impossible to know everything what's going on and uh, they contribute to their visions their points of view they help you understand uh, some uh, uh, minor processes or hidden processes. So the next step is uh, the partnership. Uh, of course, uh, we appreciate our partnership with the UNFPA and the other partners. So we realize the importance of the topic of the, the gender uh, equality and uh, domestic violence. Uh, and uh, a slide of top. Uh, sometimes you start dealing with the topic of gender equality, and you may face with more criticism for being involved in gender equality. Then uh, our key partners assist us in improving our content and working inside the company. So the next step is communication and accountability. I can help but repeat that it's very important to exchange views in a so to say private manner We arrange uh, some events at our company. At these events, uh, the uh, heads of the units, the top management addresses to the employees, show them that they share these values. At the Starlight Media, we decided that every year we will publish the report on the progress achieved in order to adjust our actions by publishing official information on our plans next year. Definitely we'll be sharing all the stakeholders the information on the problems and the challenges we faced with for other businesses to use our lessons learned. So the final slide was entitled Formula of Success. Uh, the goals should be clear the involvement of stakeholders, all the stakeholders is important. It's crucial to have opportunity to learn and to teach. So awareness raising is a very session than partnership, communication and accountability and reporting. So the reporting is a very important part. That's all from my part.
Thank you, Jana. I'm very grateful. Thank you for these uh, really clear recommendations. I'll tell you goodbye and now I'd like to pass the floor to Ms. Olga Klimenka, Corporate Communications Manager representing Procter & Gamble Company. Procter & Gamble develops a the report on gender-based pay gap. In their activities, they mainstream gender equality. For instance, the, the Gillette advert, advertising focuses on uh, combating uh, masculinism or uh, tight detergent uh, video or uh, commercial is for... Uh, equal distribution of uh, household duties. Uh, good afternoon, I'm very glad to see you. I've been listening to the previous speakers and it was really pleasant. I'm at home now and I feel proud of being the part of the company because indeed we implement all we can and uh, we are going along the right path. Let me tell you a story about my joining the company, why I'm there until now, and then I will tell you about implementation of gender equality policy. In 2006, I joined the company as the hotline operator working with customers. I was a student at that time, and even then I started learning more about the company. Actually, I fell in love with the company. It's 14 years since uh, I joined the company now and the head of the corporate communications in the company and I still love my job. So at that time, I had already worked at several national companies and then I realized that I was willing to work for a company with very clear policies focusing on human rights and very clear, clear rules of games irrespective of the gender of your identification. Or peculiarities. Therefore, I'm still with this company what do we do in terms of gender equality? First, within the company, oh, we have achieved some uh, results we can say we are proud of because in 1992, uh, women made only 5% of top management positions. In 2011, that's 30%. Today, this indicator makes 43%. So I'm talking about a global picture. By the way, women make the half of uh, uh, the managing board in the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian branch of the company. And we believe that if the world is equal, it will be better. In the company, we have been implementing the policy, policies making the world inside the company equal. And we see that in spite of the progress you can make inside the company, the world outside is still biased. We call these prejudice myths. And these myths, this bias prevents women from unfolding their potential and occupying top management positions. And we believe in these myths, we communicate them to the world. Therefore, we undertook a commitment to unveil these myths within the company and beyond. We have identified four major myths which prevent us from achieving gender equality all across the globe. We call them myth about leadership, myth about uh, career, myth about balance and myth about harassment. These are four basic, I would say, biases which make our life worse inside the company. 
each of these myths each of this myth uh, is important. The biggest myth is the myth about leadership. And uh, according to this myth, women uh, have not enough leadership qualities. Everything is okay with women. We just define the leadership as itself in a very narrow way. And this definition is not in line with the reality. For us, we define leadership in a very aggressive way. Leadership means being aggressive, self-confident, authoritative. In fact, the leadership has a lot of uh, different forms and leadership can be demonstrated in a number of ways. We know that both men and women demonstrate different types of behavior. This doesn't mean that someone has more or less leadership qualities. The matter is that we, girls and boys, are being socialized in the way to demonstrate different types of the behavior. There is nothing wrong about that, but uh, the problem is that the leadership should be recognized in all its forms, in all its manifestations. The leadership should be genderless. So that was the first myth. The second myth, that's the myth which we call myth about career. It says, and we believe it very often, that the labor market experiences lack of qualified women. Indeed, this is not true. Lots of studies were dedicated to this topic. Women are underrepresented on top management positions. However, we see that our society is uh, distributed nearly equally, nearly 50-50. Both men and women have access to higher education. If we take Ukrainian statistics, We've got even more women with higher educations. According to the most recent data, 54% of women got higher education. Or if we take employment statistics, we will see that about 73% of women are employed versus 68% of men. Women. But women who study and work equally with men, unfortunately, are underrepresented on the top management positions. So where do these women go? We as a company hire half men and half women. But why do not these women reach the top management positions? There is a very simple solution. Uh, the policies should be implemented and uh, the performance should be assessed according to the same criteria. So mean, this means that everyone should be treated equally. Another important aspect is the use of simple mathematics, mathematics for dummies as we call it. Let's say the managing board is considered by 12 persons, there are only three women. So then the distribution between men and women is 25 to 75% of you as a CEO are willing to have a, a balance inside your managing director. So you have to increase this indicator from 25 to 50%. This might seem not feasible, especially in the short term prospects from one to three years. This means that the managing board uh, should include three women more. It is easy to achieve this if you cultivate the workforce in the company, both men and women. So traditionally, companies pay more attention to career growth, to professional development of men rather than women.
Hola, I'm so sorry we have to finish with these two myths left because we've got other speakers and we've got our next sessions. Okay, thank you, Marina. The third myth is myth about balance. We believe that all the work should be done by women and the, the men. They have to care about their career. This is a myth, of course, and we are trying to combat it not only inside the company, but also internally through our advertising, which you have mentioned. What do we do in the company? We implement the policies which enable men to pay more attention or spend more time with the families. In July 2019, we have introduced a policy of paid child care leave for men, for dads. They can get eight weeks of paid child care leave if they've got a child or they have, a f uh, have adopted a child. Uh, this uh, uh, piece of news was uh, uh, warmly accepted by men. In Ukraine, both uh, technicians and top managers get benefits uh, of this uh, policy. Within half a year, five men use this benefit. F four of them are men working at the production. So this works quite well. And we see that for our employees, it's a demonstration of the fact that we do care we do not just talk about gender equality in our commercials, but we implement uh, the uh, working policies and offer true assistance to our employees, facilitating them in spending more time with their families. Thus, they can uh, have more time with their kids, uh, fearing not of uh, losing their job or their income. This is psychological support for them as well. And the last myth I would like to tell you about is the myth about harassment. Many people believe that women are to blame for the harassment at the workplace or beyond. Indeed, I'd like to say that harassment is not just sexual harassment. It can be also emotional harassment or verbal harassment. In fact, there are no other recommendations but for zero tolerance. It is. It should not be just on paper. This policy must be effective. If an employee reports uh, that uh, he or she experienced harassment, we've got at the company special mechanisms uh, which are put in place to analyze uh, the situation and uh, all this, the relevant measures are taken. As a rule, uh, this happens quite quickly if uh, an employee if an employee feels safe at workplace. If employees feel feel that nothing wrong can happen to them at the workplace. This is for them a, an, an element of a psychological safety and security. The company is very serious about this policy. This is perhaps one of the first policy policies which should be implemented by our businesses. It should be just on paper again. This should be a working obligation and it should be also communicated outwards. So the companies must uh, stick to the obligations irrespective of uh, the person in question. Even if uh, a very important person is uh, accused of harassment, the company should have no doubts about actions against this person. So, no exclusion. I've been working for Procter & Gamble for 14 years already and I'm very happy to see that the policies do work and they do not exist on paper. They work 
and it's very pleasant to see that these policies work in Ukraine. Therefore, I can bravely say that both exist and function. It's important and it's not that easy as it may seem. So I'm urging everyone to follow the gender policy, implement the gender policy inside the company. It helps the company to improve the image, to retain the best talents and have the good reputation of a good employer in the market. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, thank you. you what you speak is truth. You preach the truth about the boards. And right now we don't have time for questions, but I have an offer. Uh, maybe you can answer in the stream two questions. First, how did you determine the myths? Because this is a very interesting approach. And secondly, uh, so the mathematics <laughs> that you and how many men we had on parental leave. Just give the answer in the stream. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to get your answers under the post. Uh, so now we come to the next speaker, Anna Adam, HR director at Fair Expo Company. So they work with the, the Ferris or production, uh, the iron or production in the uh, the uh, in Ukraine, so they are in. They're ranked as one of the top companies in that area, and for you, gender equality is quite a priority, as far as we know. So, Anna, we are really grateful to have you here. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to tell about our experience on improving the situation in gender equality. So, I'd like to bring my presentation on the screen, if. Uh, it's possible yeah thank you it's there so truly we are a company uh, working in the industrial area heavy industry especially when it comes uh, to gender equality well traditionally in this area we've had mostly men for many decades in centuries so for us this is actually a very important task to take the measures that can change the situation for better so the next slide please so for the company, we've picked five key goals to improve the situation of the gender equality in the company. I will not stop at three, f at three first because for our top management, they are obvious. So what can gender equality bring to company when it comes to innovations and productivity growth and uh, satisfying the stakeholders' expectations? Just two key moments I'll stop at. So increasing the applicants in candidates reserve and discrimination elimination because in our opinion these actually are two most important areas where the general quality of discrimination can be generated because the first thing is about recruitment so when they personally enters the company and uh, then the further movement and promotion Second comes to career development, how to retain women at their positions. Please, uh, next slide. Please, next slide. So, if we compare a company with other companies in our industry, we can see that if we take the percent of women at the enterprises, so it's really high, it's higher than an average in the market, especially in the companies like uh, Smarco, BHP. But if you take the percent of women who take positions, top positions, top management positions, so a little bit of a negative situation and even a decreasing dynamics, this urged us again to take a closer look at our policies and practices and programs to evaluate them and to design a project on how to improve the situation. Next slide, please. This is it. This is the tree that we actually, it is a tree. This is how we understand the advantages, how managers can recognize the advantages when it comes to the role of women who build the, the career in the company. This is what we build communication in, internal communication. We understand that one of the most problematic issues, our culture, mentality, is that unfortunately we got this as a heritage those barriers that we have today quite often they are based on social and cultural and mental myths you know and a lot of prejudices there usually a lot of bias now currently uh the situation with the presence of women in top management level it looks like that in company so the highest percent of women we have in 
Uh, so you can see that 18, 12, and 11% respectively in different sections. So we can skip this slide. So we do we do understand that we have these stimulating things when it comes to international legislation and regulations, but we do have certain internal things, internal there is some internal impetus that allows us to get more women in management. So we developed a program. It can it contains five key steps and each step it has its uh, aim to be reached. What should be done to change the situation? Why we decided to come to this project program approach because we defined certain barriers and uh, negative factors which are the obstructions which do not allow the women uh, which do not allow others to promote women and women themselves to develop their careers when the company is small example when a person a woman is offered uh, a much better paid job better position one of the fears that she has inside is that her income level will be higher than of her husband's you know <laughs> and it may bring certain it may generate certain conflicts in the family or the family will disapprove the woman uh, and call her a workaholic because many want women to be good mothers good housewives so we certainly have these cultural internal external factors that are the barriers that obstruct the gender equality to become a reality in the company so the next slide please uh, so still we do have a huge potential we have huge capacity what we did we analyzed all our personnel in the company we took a closer look at how many women and men in which positions and what type of activities they do have engineering technical personal managers or the blue collars so next slide what we determined who of them has high educational qualification, vocational education, uh, technical education. And uh, we actually took a close look at the professions out of all this pool, what is available for women and if they already are employed, there where women simply can work. And the next slide. We understood what is the uh, average duration, working duration, working experience for men and women at certain positions. And on the basis of this analytics, we launched these focus groups, questionnaires for women. Do they have, for example, a wish or potential to move forward, to develop? What is the key obstruction for them? What keeps them from it? So what are the barriers inside the company? What are the barriers outside the company as well? And we also were interested if they actually, what is their perspective? What is their uh, understanding of the solutions for these problems? If we take a closer look, the situation is not that bad. Of course, women who work within the company, they have certain leadership skills. They want to build their careers in a proper way. So what is the manager's task? To create the tools that will help them to solve internal and external, to eliminate external and internal barriers and to build the career in the company. Next slide, please. So the tasks of the project, key three tasks, so to increase the number of women at top management level. So increase the involvement of women to reach the gender balance and to mitigate the staff deficiency. So we want women to be involved in the development of solutions, not just managers to give them ready-made solutions, but without the women when it comes to gender equality. And also eliminate the barriers that are obstructions for the career growth of women. So the glass ceilings must be broken entirely. Next slide, please. So, uh, we've set the goal, we've set the aim, uh, not just a, as a programmatic effect, but the KPIs for the managers as well. We fixed these and we are implementing it already. So, the next slide. This program, it looks like that, nine key steps that we have right now. We are at the ninth step already. Very good. So as I told you, we've done a lot of analytical work simply to understand 
do women have future in that area, that industry? We have a very good story, a very positive one, because in our company, we've implemented a grading system or an annual appraisal. We have 100% of this appraisal for all our employees of both genders, almost 10,000 people that have this annual appraisal. And we've taken all the subjective, we've minimized all these subjective uh, things in it, subjective components. When it comes to career development, it's not just the manager's task, the supervisor's task, but individual features and individual achievements of a person are taken into account in the commission's opinion. So we determined the positions uh, where we have the reserve, so women with the potential to become managers in future, we've tested them, we understood what advantages and disadvantages they do have, strong and weak, uh, uh, let's say characteristics, we've uh, adopted and signed and approved the program for this development and certain extra events, what may be there, so certain measures and events, how can we support women who want to become masters or engineers or school for women who want to become engineers, for example, and technical specialists, uh, what can we do to help women to become uh, the managers of a higher level? Unfortunately, quarantine and coronavirus uh, made us, uh, forced us to, to adapt it a little bit. We've planned to have a conference for women leaders. And if uh, this conference <laughs> took place, we would have this discussion. We would uh, have the opinions of uh, the strongest leaders among women companies but we do hope that in the summer eventually we'll run this conference and we'll form this women's club as we call this a ninth step so we'll have these regular meetings regular discussions with the women leaders uh, to have this systematical uh, have these systematic consultations uh, to be provided their colleagues ninth step again we have whole package of HR tools designed all these good ideas basically everything that we've produced to be used so remote and f remote work and flexible schedules for women with small children or for example if these women would like to return to work a little bit earlier so again parental leave for dads because quite often men take this leave not due to some cultural uh they, they simply refuse to take this leave not because of some cultural you know um uh, bias and prejudice but because they don't want to lose their money so we have a program of equal access both men and women to parental leave so if a man decides <laughs> to take leave the company will be absolutely able to fund that opportunity so uh Again, one of the tools, one of the interesting tools that we have is that when a woman is uh, staying at her maternity leave, uh, the situation is changing rapidly and um, certain skills emerge, certain knowledge. Uh, so the group itself changes. There is a turnover. And in three mo years, when a woman returns, it's really hard to adapt for her to the new conditions. So that's why we've uh, actually anticipated that and we have certain training that is available for a woman staying on the leave and also there is a certain service uh, on supporting the children while the woman is uh, taking certain courses soft skills technical skills IT skills whatever so we also understand we also understand there is one more issue on how to train the manager supervisor how to promote them to lose this fear of putting women to better positions. This is a very, very sensitive topic and it's more related to how to develop this managerial skill as leadership skill, <laughs> which is really essential for them. And as you saw in the very beginning, we, we, we showed you this tree, the opinions of managers. So what is the role of women? What is the advantage of women at a certain position? Again, we'll have this program on changing the mindset male mindset about females and about hard components so certain filters to be implemented during the recruitment stage for example when we have a couple of applications for for men and women in equal conditions with equal knowledge with equal experience for the same position uh, we really want women to be preferential candidates so 
in brief, this is our experience. If there are any questions, we're really grateful. I'm really grateful to answer. Thank you, Anna. It was really, really, really interesting. I know it's not enough time to tell about everything. Please, under the stream, do tell us about your program of women's training, women's leadership. Please tell us what that was. How do you envisage this program? This would be interesting, I guess, for our colleagues as well and our partners. Thank you. Thank you. You're doing so much work. You're doing really, really, really nice work. Really cool things. And right now, we have uh, another great speaker, Hanna Patapova, HR consultant. For so many years, she has uh, helped develop employees, started with Kodak, then Malaxis company, and also global programs of involving talents. And also, Anna is a certified by the organization Society of HR Management, very reputable organization and senior certified professional she is. So I asked the question, who was responsible for gender gap, uh, to talk about the gender gap. So I wanted someone to talk about the gender gap in Ukraine. Anna, tell us something, give us recommendations, how to compare these the salaries, how to work with that issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Marina, for the invitation actually to take part in this wonderful webinar. And today, uh, as Marina told, I really want to share some information on how we uh, managed to conduct pay gap analysis, how we compare the difference in reimbursement between men and women in big international organization, and uh, maybe these tools will be useful to you as well. So the next slide, please. So first of all, why do we need to have pay gap analysis conducted in some countries, especially in developed countries right now? This is the uh, legislative requirements. The company has to conduct analysis and uh, to um, publish the results of this analysis for the share. holders and for employees and for the public as well. So, so it comes to business ethics, the values of company as well, why do we need the analysis? The wish uh, to pay fairly and equally for the same work and again to provide equal opportunities to develop career for m to men and women. Also current market conditions and competition fight for talents. Basically when it comes to Productivity doesn't matter man or woman. You simply need to get profit. You need to have a talented employee, skilled employee. We want to retain these people in the company. And also, uh, at this stage of the social media development and such websites and resources and Glassdoor, so how to impact the image of the employer, how to change the policies and practices of the company. It also affects the perception of this employer it also affects the uh, perception of the stakeholders. For example, the Glassdoor, we have the article uh, about the results of analysis, pay gap analysis that they conducted uh, uh, using their own data. Next slide, please. So, if we talk about the level, about the pay gap at the, level, at the state level, According to the Comfrey Hay Group survey at the state level, it would be really high. But if we go deeper to the organization level, lower, sorry, and then if we take uh, conduct the analysis for reimbursement uh, of uh, the employee's activity at the same level, same grade, this difference will a little bit minimize. So. If we go inside the organization, we simply need to understand when this difference actually emerges, when it occurs. At different stages, it may be the recruitment, then uh, regular appraisal, regular review of the payment when people move from one position to another to higher positions. And of course, these decisions, our own perception uh, impacts it, our bias our prejudice when you make decision on the uh, reimbursement, on payment of men and women, and uh, also the personal story of the candidate or applicant or the uh, current employee. According to the survey, women have this tendency to underestimate themselves first. And it, of course, affects the expectations that they proclaim 
actually, when they try to find another job or another position and also their expectation on the reimbursement at a new position. Also, these long leaves, when a woman takes care of a child for a year or two more, it affects, again, uh, her career development process and reimbursement level because many companies, unfortunately, they don't revise the salary amount when the woman is at her maternity leave and uh, still the difference is there, considerable difference. So the next slide please. So, so KFHG used this formula that you can see on your screen when for example the average women's salary we subtract the average men's salary out of it and uh, Below the line, we have, again, the average men's salary. So we have this figure. It can be less than a zero. And uh, the smaller it is, the bigger the difference is. The bigger the, g bigger the gap is. Closer to the zero means uh, that the gap is uh, very slight, very minor. Or let's say it's more or less fair. So at the level of organization, it's very important to go deeper, of course, because uh, the average... Figure is always the average figure as the average temperature in the ward. So it's really important to understand what impacts this difference, what generates the difference itself, the gap itself. And then we analyze other data, like for example, what, like do we have a pay gap for the employees that work at the same level, at the same position, or even at the same grade? Then we go even deeper and take the data like the same grade, the same level, and then in functional sections as well, also deeper, taking uh, certain clusters of position like system administrators, financial analysts, and so on. Also in organizations, uh, which are located in uh, different parts of the globe, we simply need to take uh, a Sorry, especially when we have different affiliates in different parts of the country or parts even of the region, we simply need to understand the specificity of the region. Specificity, why, for example, there is a pay gap when it comes to affiliates even. So, can we move further? Yes. So, in order to understand why we do have the pay gap, why it emerges, and what actually shapes this gap when it comes to men and women, we need to take some additional indicators and additional data that can be included in the analysis. Okay. So, the average. The average figure is really great, and it will depend on the indicators that are different from others. We simply need to have a clear understanding of what the average figure, the average indicator is. We'll simply get some additional data for a more detailed analysis. So minimum, maximum for reimbursement. And also it's very good to have individual labor productivity indicators of a company it does have this program of performance management and take a closer look at uh, does productivity and labor efficiency impact the payment? The median value together with the average value. Also other elements uh, and also the total remuneration analysis come to this level. So. Also, the pay gap may be affected by such factors as experience of work in a certain company or experience of work at a certain position. Also, what you need to include, the labor market data, not just the competitiveness, salary, but also to understand the gender distribution of employees in certain area or industry. For example, if we take... Uh, Minors, let's say, of course, we'll have uh, more men there, it's purely obvious, but if uh, we do take the counting area, it's, uh, let's say, <laughs> captured by women mostly. So we ha do have many companies that create programs to involve the labor market to a certain industry more women. I know that 
uh, KS we sent it us that. So right now we need to see how women are presented at top management and the best paid position. And just to share the example with you, so you can see, you can see here, not the absolute data on uh, just relative ones. So the competitiveness of a salary. So in percent, the labor market level. So what is the reason? I simply cannot uh, share the absolute data. The second thing is that this analysis was conducted for the international company. For us, it was really important to, to, to get the whole information, the whole package of information. So all geographical locations, all the employees. Uh, so you can see that at this slide, there is a difference between the there is a pay gap for men and women, almost 10% if we take the general indicators on average data. So, so the blue line uh, in the yellow frames and separate grades are there. 11th grade, please take it. And we can see that there even is a bigger gap, 96 in 112. And the number of employees within these grades Basically, it's enough. It's really that it's really enough to say that there is a problem. The problem does exist. So, what can affect that? What can influence that? What can influence the gap? And for example, we can see how these indicators, how these figures, are affected by the labor productivity. And uh, to those data, we also included the parameters of those employees who really uh, present satisfactory and excellent productivity, uh, an excellent performance. We can see that there is a pay gap again between men and women. In spite of the fact that they may be highly productive, but still there is a gap, unfortunately. So there is a clear problem. We have something to work on. Next. As I mentioned, and the previous speakers mentioned as well, the presentation of women at top management positions. So many companies right now, they do say that they need to stick to this gender balance concept at the top management level. It's really important to see whether there is a gender balance kept at other positions in the organization. Why? Because this is the staff reserve. This is the background, the backbone that can be in future uh, promoted to certain top positions. If there is disbalance at lower positions, like at the, at the level of mid-management, well, in future you'll have the same disproportion again and nothing changes. And you won't have enough women, female applicants for the top management positions. So uh, with this example of this company, this is a tech company and it's pretty clear that at high tech market, of course, men are more preferential than women. Still, unfortunately, but it's true. So, so of course, we can have the same analysis for functional units as well. And we can see how properly women are presented at different positions, like the accounting units, for example. We can check that HR administrative. And um, quite often, companies face this challenge that despite... So, for example, they uh, take this function, they uh, analyze the function where women dominate and uh, at lower positions we'll have more women. Uh, then we go up and up and up and at the top level we don't have women at all. And mostly we have men as their managers and supervisors. So, Anya, Anya, I'm sorry, but we do actually have to conclude. Please, a little bit faster. It's just for us to finish on time and proceed to the next session. Okay. If an organization realizes that there is still space for improvement, it is important for this uh, organization to make a business case and it should be supported by the top management, by the leadership, without the consent or approval by the leadership such initiatives might be lost and it is important to analyze the needs of organization what else can be done to make changes within the organization it is possible to launch the 
audit of the culture or the corporate culture to understand what has an impact on the equality, then it is possible to arrange focus groups involving women to realize what prevents them from career growth, from career development. And these focus groups, groups can also produce the programs or initiatives on improving these issues. Thank you. And yeah, thank you so much. I would like to thank all the speakers participating in this panel discussion. Mikhailo enlisted main parameters which have to be focused on during gender audit. Then Starlight Media shared their 10 commitments and they talked about their five steps towards the progress and then progress uh, Procter and Gamble talked us about uh, the myths and how to fight them then Thorax it's a unique company representing heavy industry talked about their own nine steps and Anna shared with us the insights about the pay gaps and uh, she informed us or made some recommendations on what the company can do for tomorrow, for the sake of tomorrow. Of course, uh, we should also speak not only about uh, internal activities, but also external activities such as non-discriminative advertising and communication. It's high time for the next panel. I'm so sorry. We are running out of time, therefore we cannot arrange this uh, coffee break. But you know, the experience is unique and everyone is uh, willing to share. So I'd like to pass the floor to Ms. Olena Davlikanova. She is the project coordinator from the Friedrich Herbert Fund in Ukraine and Belarus. And I'd like to ask all the speakers of this, pan of this panel, you will have only 15 minutes. So let's stick to this schedule. Olena, hello, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, thank you for your time to participate in this workshop. Thank you for invitation. Let me dwell very briefly on the main statements. In 2011, the Friedrich Ebert Fund, this is a German fund funded by the federal budget of Germany, started the project on the standards of non-discriminative advertising and our next speaker will tell you more about the standards. I will say just a couple of words illustrating why this topic is especially relevant for companies, why companies should not produce and spread discriminative advertising. When we started this project, we relied not only on gender studies, but also on the real experience of global companies, advertising companies and marketologists that studied these aspects. And they made the following conclusion. As of now, the market has changed a lot. And the consumers of the advertising change as well. Since we are running out of time, I would like to invite you to the website of Friedrich Ebert Fund. There is a link to a publication which explains the cause and effect very clearly. So the main conclusion the researchers arrived at is that sexist or discriminative advertisements which uh, communicates sometimes even stereotypes of violence demonstrating people as uh, uh, sexual objects causes psychological physical and financial losses because uh, this advertising do uh, does not also communicate the myths, it produces them, myths and bias, and all of us should be aware of the consequences of our actions. The marketologists, the advertisers and the customers should be aware of the effects 
of such advertising campaigns. Let me immediately bring it to your attention, bring these two pictures to your attention. At the bottom of the screen, this is a one of the practical techniques you can use when you approve certain advertising campaigns. If you change the gender of the characters, of the commercial characters, so you replace a woman by a man, this can be perceived as a non-discriminative commercial. And uh, this technique is called mirroring. If this in, if in this mirroring you see that something is wrong, you f you may guess that the message hides some or conceals some negative impact. A study was conducted by the British Association on Advertising Standards. Uh, it studied lots of uh, advertising companies and consumers and it arrived at the conclusion that consumers of uh, the commercials are not willing to see the discriminative uh, advertisements. They are offended if they uh, are called uh, less uh, uh, powerful, less capable, just based on gender. Let me emphasize that advertising should change a lot, should change continuously. Lots of marketologists may tell you that this is the thing which sells, but you should be aware of the fact that the history of um, advertising remembers uh, cases uh, when Marlboro used uh, children for advertising campaigns because at that time uh, people didn't believe that smoking is harmful for children but now it is of course uh, unacceptable this is uh, the legislative violation this is breach of law and uh, now it is worth listening it is not worth listening to marketologists and advertisers that would enforce some images of nude women for instance they might tell you that uh, it, this will bring profit and lots of attention, but it's not true, in fact. If you're interested, you can learn more about this study. It was conducted by GFK and British Association. The materials are translated, and in this very publication, there are all the links to the psychological theories in particular, which justify the study, but unfortunately we have no time with, for these details. Let's skip two slides and look at this uh, statement, at this quotation. It says, sex does not sell. It Sex does not sell. It's proactivism which sells. Certain images which are recognizable, which are unified, are images that sell. For instance, Disney, Netflix, Pixar images. When an advertiser offers you something, many of them try to open the hidden door to the consciousness of uh, the uh, consumer. Uh, this consciousness is filled with a big number of characters, of a uh, series of memos which we use or which we see in our information, uh, in our media space. Just to confirm the information I shared, I'll give you a couple of examples. This is uh, the uh, commercial of 2018 or 19 for uh, John Lewis Trade Center. 35.2 million of uh, views. How did they achieve that? Because uh, it was shot uh, shortly after a very famous uh, cartoon. A, s a man lives uh, on the moon and a small girl uh, use the telescope to see him and in order to communicate with him she bought in this very trade center a 
telescope and sends him this telescope hanging on the balloons and this is the start of their communication. Then the uh, this this commercial became very popular due to the high level of attention. Then another very profitable commercial of Procter and Gamble. It was produced for the Indian market. A dad visits his daughter and sees that she starts doing this unpaid household work after the regular work and her husband doesn't help her at all so she arrives from work and then she starts uh, starts cooking uh, washing uh, serving the husband the child and so on and then uh, this dad came back home and said now i realize that i have my own role and uh, the motto of this com of this campaign was share the load like a girl this is a huge advertising campaign you might have heard about it it was launched to change the stereotype to break the stereotype of being a girl if you are acting as a girl or a perceiving person as a girl you may offend but why this there is nothing negative about that and as you see there were 85 million of views uh, and after this uh, advertising campaign the attitude of people changed people uh, became more aware more conscious about the language they use because frequently we just do not contemplate uh, the language we use the cliches we voice but these cliches uh, they have an impact on our behavior and our daily practices both at home and at work For those who produce commercials for advertisers, I can say that there are lots of topics, interesting topics, topics which appeal to the uh, consumers. And by these topics, you may draw the attention of the consumers, the customers. In fact, these topics do work. They are on the screen. I hope you have read them all. When someone says that nothing changes, this is not true. Everything changes very quickly. Like, let's take a company, Pirelli. You know, this is a renowned company. And since 2018, they published uh, a calendar, a kind of playboy. But since 2018 or even in 2019, they changed the approach to the materials they use in this uh, calendar. As you see, they shifted from the nude images to more conceptual things. This calendar was fully dedicated to Alice in Wonderland mirror and ethnic equality and uh, only uh, models with black skin were, were involved to creation of this uh, calendar a couple of words more about the trends uh, for instance uh, this is uh, the photo of a child demonstrating the needs of children uh, with a, with special needs and this uh, child uh, with down syndrome became uh, the uh, image of a gerber company which produces uh, baby food and of course the authorities uh, do not step aside in uh, paris in march 2018 they prohibited the sexist advertising on the billboards placed in the public uh, space. So that's a space uh, which we cannot avoid, which all the pedestrians can see. This is the advertisement by Yves Saint Laurent. Many models 
similarly with anorexia, were shown as uh, abandoned things. So there is nothing personal about that. There are no criteria by which you can decide what object is uh, what object is meant. So that when people are equal to things. Okay, Elena, I'm sorry we have to continue because we've got other speakers. I have a big request. Could you please give us a link to the standards and the criteria of advertising you have mentioned? If we take the advertising market of Ukraine, There is, uh, if we take the uh, scale from 0 to 10, 0, no discriminative advertising, and 10, a lot. What's uh, the position of Ukraine on this scale? In the 90s, uh, there were about 90% of discriminative advertising, and unfortunately, there is no sound. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to pass the floor to Ms. Irona Bilek, the head of the Gender Committee on the Advertising. She's the president of Ukrainian Marketing Association. Irina is a specialist in economy. She will tell us more about a study. Well, tell us more. Irina, Irina, hi. You're welcome. You're really welcome. So tell us, please, tell us, please, what you do and the uh, it's about advertising. So tell us about the advertising industry. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you actually for raising these issues, such issues as non-discriminatory advertising or discriminatory advertising in Ukraine. So I'd really like to uh, introduce the Industrial Gender Committee on Advertising to you. Please show the next slide. This is the uh, history of our emergence. In 2010, we saw such movement as gender movement, its activation. They were talking about sexism in advertising. So we, I mean uh, the advertising experts and specialists and the market experts. So we actually tried to use this concept and try to analyze the situation with the consumers, clients in the market. So we need to listen to all opinions and get all perspectives. And take on. So we launched this project together with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Ukraine and initiated uh, and we initiated the emergence of non-discriminatory advertising standard. We faced, first of all, what we faced, we started this conversation with the advertising market uh, professional advertising market and the first thing that was mentioned is responsibility you know there is such uh, uh well experts always told us okay so advertising look it only reflects something that we do have in the community but advertising uh is such a massive one it's everywhere it's almost everywhere it forms it shapes informational space in the community it forms stereotypes it nurtures stereotypes it's not just a mirror that reflects. So this is something that we had to understand. They had to understand. So we developed a standard. The standards were registered. 
in the State Enterprise Ukrainian Research Institute for the Problems of Standardization, Certification, Quality. And uh, in 2014, we launched regional representatives of our committee in 17 regions of Ukraine. So please, the next one. Uh, but the we can write a lot of standards, <laughs> but we want to these standards to be supported. I'm so proud to say that all these reputable associations that work uh, in the advertising market, they are present here, most all of them, with the gender organizations, the, the gender organizations uh, uh, were like experts for us and we use their opinions to revise our standards and to develop them. So sexism. So we spoke about sexism. Sexism is a concept and practice of discrimination. Uh, so we speak about... Uh, actually destroying the dignity of a person on the basis of gender. So when you talk about sexism, this is it. When you talk about advertising, we need uh, we need to remember always that the key task of the advertising is to sell, to sell the product, to sell the service, and you cannot sell a product by discriminating, by humiliating people based on gender. So this is not a reason, absolutely. We asked ourselves a question, okay, so we do understand that you cannot humiliate people, but we as advertisers, as the market experts, how community can understand that we talk about sexist advertising, how to determine that. So we've designed the criteria you can see first, humiliation of any gender through uh, broadcasting the stereotypical perception on intellectual, physical, social or other advantages of one gender comparing to another or stereotyping roles to be showed everywhere so in uh, this advertising no one is undressing anyone <laughs> but this advertising is i think it's uh, the most dangerous it gives the most damage it's really it's really unsafe because in this advertising you are told that okay this is your place woman this is your place you know <laughs> this is your corner and uh, you know, in the kitchen, <laughs> where we usually should stay, where the man's place is, they do tell. And uh, you constantly are told about that. You are perceived. You know, that we had this advertising, man turned the world. It was really professional. It was visually professional. But the key message of the advertising, man rotate the world, man turn the world. Advertisers told me, look at these pictures. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Why do you tell me this is a sexist advertising? I tell. Because man, you you force man to think in a certain way about women. It's about interhuman relations. We enter human relations. We intervene into human relations. So we force people. We want them to make this specific kind of relation. So the ad that nurtures, nurtures stereotypes, these are the most dangerous for the community. Again, I want to remind you that advertising sells. But... When person uh, advertises sells something and uses human just as a decoration, a sexual object, well, this is a pure humiliation of a person. So if we have certain uh, hints, certain concealed ideas, concepts about sexual intercourse that has no uh, connection with a product, this is humiliation, this is sexist. So unfortunately, we do have sexual violence which is used in advertising to sell. But what I want to stress on, we discussed that as well, that depicting naked people in advertising is not always sexism. If it is related to use of the product, okay, if it's about notifying the consumer of the product, yes, we may uh, actually use it elsewhere. Next slide, please. So just... To demonstrate what actually the sexist ad is, what we had in what we have in Ukrainian streets. Look at that. I want to I want to show you how the criteria can illustrate it. So this is the LED lighting advertising. LED lighting, purely technical. But you can see what's written there. Take me. I'm burning. I'm sorry. I I can work for long hours and I don't consume enough food. I'm sorry. This wonderful girl is used just as a sexual object, as a decoration there, and women were really, really, really angry with that. We had loads of complaints for this ad specifically. Okay, car wash. Well, 
the perception of a woman. She's just uh, a sexual decoration for a wonderful car, just as wonderful as ladies. So two objects basically are there. So as usual. Oh. So today uh, we use more and more the men's uh, men bodies images. So you can see one of the examples of how we can actually use how advertisers use that the cafe advertising cafe board. So. They sell, sell pizzas, actually. <laughs> so I, I can't understand what's the relation, but anyway. So with the help of this naked body, they think they will sell more, I think. So. Uh, and we have loads, loads of these ads, you know, that... Uh, that are based on relations. Which are not connected to the product at all. So there is no connection, no clear connection. Ukraine, you know, quite often they use, uh, I'll give you something free of charge, so I'll turn you on, she'll turn you on. So when the image is combined with this verbal messages, it somehow ignites the sexual context, you know, clear sexual context. When you see the sad, you are turned on, definitely. Now, we can ask actually ourselves, okay, what's so bad about that? I'll tell you why this is a bad thing. I'll remind you, that this is an outdoor advertising. Everyone sees that. Everyone. It's public. Children, young people, adults, everyone. So it's distributed everywhere. It's everywhere. And people just put it in their heads and they start thinking that sex is available anytime woman or a man is just an object to satisfy one's needs so we can insult anyone easily. And please, advertisers, do not be surprised when we see certain negative manifestations like violence, aggression uh, in relations, relations like that in families. So if we produce that kind of stereotypes... I don't want to say that only advertisers are to blame, but when we create advertising, please, please do remember about publicity, about distribution, and that we create, we are the authors of messages for the community. We create the informational space and surrounding that we live in. Oh, look at that. Okay, so the construction materials enterprise. With me, you get harder. I'm sorry, What what's that about? So... <laughs> How can you connect it to the concrete <laughs> that you used to build uh, houses? The stereotyped roles. So, mother. So, uh, a good home is made by mother. You cannot, you cannot put these stereotypes in it. You cannot. So, a house is made wonderful. At, where is the father? Where is his role? Where is he? Let's allow dad to contribute <laughs> to this... <laughs> Uh, let's allow our dads to take active part in family's life and make house a better place anyway. So it's really okay for the dad to do as well, to play with a child. So parental leave is normal. So we need to respect that. The community must start respecting that. Okay. Sexual violence. Just, I just want to show you this slide because this is really very, very elegant. Just to remind you, they simply sell dumplings. Duff with meat is sold with this. <laughs> okay, the next slide, please. So how do we work? I just want to tell you how do we work. So uh, we get complaints and uh, we get requests uh, from the State Consumer Protection Service of Ukraine um, just to provide an expert's opinion on certain occasions. So this is the statistics only for 2019. 200 complaints. Fewer than we had in 2018, we can compare. So 200 uh, we got in 2019. We acknowledged 148 ads as discriminatory, 125 expert opinions. And uh, in total, we've stopped 130 sexist campaigns. Unfortunately, Ukrainian state consumer protection uh, protection service cannot simply prohibit and impose fines. 
But 130 of these campaigns were stopped with joint efforts. This is our achievement. So the next slide, please. This is the slide that we took uh, from the State Consumer Protection Service of Ukraine. I just want to show it to the manufacturers. So there is a myth. There is a myth that fines are minor, fines are very small. No. So look at that. Look at that. It's just with the sexism. So this amount goes only for the sexism, but we have much, much more. So it's really considerable. And today we talk and we really have this fruitful cooperation with the Ministry of Social Policy, with the Friedrich Hibbert Foundation on bringing the amendments to uh, legislation and advertising. When in 2011 we adopted the standards, I simply thought that it would be really nice to have the act of market self-regulation for the market actually to stop producing that kind of ads. But unfortunately, it's not enough. It's appear It appeared not to be enough. And when we talk to advertisers and ask why it's still there, they say, okay, standard is a very good thing because... The standard gives us an opportunity to show the advertiser that this uh, that, that this product can simply be large, distributed. But when advertisers tell where exactly in the law it is told that uh, wh where there is a definition of discriminatory, gender-based discriminatory advertising, there is no such definition in the law. And they simply state that if there is nothing like that in the law if there's no definition so only with self-regulation acts you cannot simply uh, implement this policy in the market so we really 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 uh, put a lot of efforts to have this definition that clear understanding that this is prohibited okay so the next slide please just to say that we work not for the fines, for the sake of fines or for the sake of punishment. Our key aim is to raise the professionalism of advertisers and to enhance the mechanism of self-regulation, to form the conditions for the advertising to be beautiful, creative, professional, to make us happy and to sell products. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Thank you so much. Thank you. So how many fines do companies need to pay for that kind of advertising? What the fines are? This is the question. So, sorry, the, the connection, the connection, the connection is really of low quality. The fines, I got the question about the fines. So I just want to tell you that uh, the law tells us 27 if I'm not mistaken, 27th article on, of the law of advertising, yes, that it's it. For the content of the advertising, the advertiser, so, sorry, the, uh, the manufacturer of the product who actually requests the advertising. So basically the fine, the, ba the basic, the base of the fine is the price of the advertising. So anyone any anyone can actually file a complaint please if you do see something inappropriate industrial gender committee and advertising you have the contacts please we'll cooperate with you together we'll try to fix the situation thank you so much thank you but we have to say goodbye thank you for your presentation it will be available and right now we come to our next speaker instantly so Tatiana Foley gender expert she's PhD in law and she has the role, she'll actually uh, draw the line. She'll be the last one in this uh, panel session. So, Tatiana, please briefly, if it's possible, tell us about the key criteria. If you don't read the standards, how to distinguish, how to distinguish, how to set the line. Where is the watershed moment? Good afternoon, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. So, of course, it's not only about our webinar, but uh, it's a constant work with big and medium-sized business, with big corporations. So, we previously focused on organizations, uh, state organizations and private business, but it's very important to work with the discrimination issues with all of them. So, I'd like to 
state that discrimination itself, the algorithm of determination of discrimination, how to distinguish it from uh, the violations of labor rights, or social rights. Uh, so it's really very important currently. If a couple of years ago we've uh, noticed that citizens uh, actually were objecting the fact itself, right now we can say it's it's quite a trend and quite often we have complaints that I'm being discriminated. We do have it. And we stu when you start asking specific questions, how it's manifested, uh, uh, comparing to whom you are discriminated, what the feature, what feature is discriminated, so the person who files the complaint and the person who considers it, they have certain difficulties how to identify the fact of discrimination itself. So I prepared a very small presentation, as I understand that I will use a little bit of legal language, maybe it's not that um, common for business, for uh, the enterprise owners, uh, because it's not just about the words, it's about the legal definitions and formulations. So the next slide actually demonstrates when, when the demonstration is present, what we have. Discrimination is present when oh, we have a couple of components. So negative attitude, unfavorable attitude, bad attitude, uh, different attitude, but we have certain attitude, we have effect of other, other attitude, quite often it's negative, then comparing with someone. So we have two people, for example, or two groups, and we compare that these groups of people have different kind of attitude towards them. But these groups of people staying uh, in uh, the same conditions. And the attitude is different. Certain feature, characteristic is there. One feature, a couple of features, uh, when we talk about uh, multiple discrimination, for example, it's important to distinguish that. But unfavorable treatment or attitude uh, comparing to other person or group, this is not just that. It's just the first stage. For the attitude to be taken as discriminatory, we just need to prove that there was no uh, legitimate reason for that. So it was not justified. The principle of proportionality was violated. So when we speak about the uh, aim and the means to reach the same. So in a couple of minutes, we will analyze this algorithm. So the next slide, this is the screenshot from the law. This is the law on uh, combating the discrimination and fight with the discrimination law on fighting the discrimination in Ukraine. And we have uh, this algorithm. So basically, we start with the definition of uh, discrimination and anti-discrimination uh, examination. So it's really clear. It's written in a clear way. So the next slide. The key features of the law, so it gives the definition of discrimination, so forms of discrimination. It declares the principle of non-discrimination as the universal principle. Certain areas of social relations, among them uh, the area, the, the labor area, labor relations, uh, so the public administration area as well. So the regulatory procedures uh, for business, forms of discriminations are uh, presented. And uh, the last presentations told us about discriminatory advertising and uh, sexual harassment also was mentioned. This is one of the form of discrimination. Harassment is all about discrimination. So, and certain oppression and all other provisions in this law, if uh, we recognize these challenges, uh, of defining those issues. I would promote, stimulate the employers to read the law carefully, to read the regulatory framework and uh, familiarize with it. These, we have also other laws that are very important as well. Next slide, please. 
I would draw your attention to three basic laws on uh, the on the basics of discrimination prevention in Ukraine. Well, we have the algorithm definition and form. Also, the law on uh, providing equal rights and opportunities to men and women with amendments, and also the labor rights equality for all Ukrainian citizens. In 2015, an amendment was brought to the last law, to the Labor Code. A new article appeared there. Article 2.1. No, this is not the law, but the article they brought to the Labor Code. Equality of labor rights of Ukrainian citizens. So the concept changed, which uh, promulgates equality in equal relations and concerning equal rights and for employers I think it's very important also the protective features that we have on the law they are they, they actually specify the people with certain family duties and that may be important as well so the next slide it just show you where these concepts were ta concepts were taken from European uh, Court and Human Rights, so their practices, and also the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and Freedoms. Uh, so it's Article 14 of the Convention and Article 1 of the Protocol Number 12 of the Convention. So we can talk right now about dozens of court decisions. You see each other decisions from many states, and certain decisions are there for Ukraine as well. And the concept of uh, prevention from discrimination, the algorithm, and how each element is proved. Basically, the ECHR practices, this is uh, where it all comes from. So the next slide, we go back to... So we can skip it. Here we see the algorithm for identification of discrimination. Let's discuss each of these elements briefly. The first element is, uh, is uh, inferable behavior. A person who files a complaint should be able to explain clearly what was the essence of uh, intolerable or unfavorable behavior? What was it? A denial, access denial to some shop or some other premises. For instance, it was said that this person can enter and you cannot. Or there might be a proof for a pay gap or a, any leave denial. Then the second element of algorithm is the comparison. Who is the role model in this case? So the woman, this woman was prohibited versus a man or another woman, for example. And it's very, it's very impos important to identify the role model correctly. Then it's also important to identify and prove uh, the parameter for differentiation, like color or gender or something else. Sometimes this quality may be not evident. However, there is an assumption that uh, such a differentiation basis is there. Frequently, there are complaints about religious symbols. Some symbols uh, may demonstrate that a person sticks to a certain to certain religious be beliefs and thus may follow certain stereotypes. Of course, uh, it is not a must. Uh, These uh, religious symbols might be just elements of um, clothes or decoration. Then, after we had identified this unfavorable, intolerable attitude 
or behavior. We compare this behavior to other role models. Then we can assess the victimized person's condition again compared to the role model. Then the next step is a verification of the legitimate goal and the availability of proportional means. It's very important to say here that the list of qualities by which a person might be discriminated is not exhaustive. Constitution, the law on equal opportunities for men and women, the law on elimination and prevention of discrimination in Ukraine, the labor code, other pieces of legislation, they may vary in terms of uh, uh, the list of uh, the qualities like sex, uh, language, uh, nation, eth ethnical origin, race, uh, financial status. But the list of these qualities is not exhaustive. Another thing is the association. A person may be not the may not possess this that quality, but uh, he or she is associated with these qualities. There was an interesting case. A woman experienced some inferior attitude at work. She asked for flexible working hours for her to. Uh, take care about her child with special needs. And uh, this disability of the child was associated with this employee. And uh, this woman, who didn't have uh, have disability itself, she experienced this unfavorable attitude. As a result of this association with some quality, however, this uh, uh, quality was not, not imminent to this person. So this attitude, negative attitude, was related to the uh, quality, such a quality. Regarding the legitimate, legitimate goal, again, the list is not exhaustive. However, the goal should also always be clear, comprehensive, understandable and justified. For instance, currently we are experiencing extraordinary situation due to the coronavirus spread and some measures taken, they uh, restrict uh, the freedom of movement. They have a certain goal. This goal should be clearly articulated, it must be legitimate, it cannot be adjustable. The goal cannot be something that just like uh, reduce the burden on public transport. No, the goal should be more universal and legitimate. Talking about uh, the differentiation on the basis of gender, we mean that uh, such differentiation take place by certain means, and these means must be proportional. That may give you an example. It was a very important case, important decision taken by the European Court of Human Rights. It's not a very it's not a very old decision. It was not taken somewhere in the twentieth century. Even now, this decision is being discussed. This is the Konstantin Markin versus Russia case. A man, a military, by the way, when uh, we deal with di discrimination cases based on gender, lots of, com lots of plaintiffs are men. That's because the women have some legislative guarantees not to be enrolled. So, a man, a military, was denied a 
parental leave. A child care leave. A child care leave. So this was a, a dad with three kids and so on and so forth. But let's discuss a very particular fact. This child care leave denial. As a role model, a woman, a female military, was taken. So, in this case, legislatively, the differentiation is clear. Neither in Russia nor in Ukraine or other countries, uh, there is uh, any uh, definition of uh, gender-based discrimination. The legitimate goal the government referred to was actually dual. In the previous presentation there were lots of uh, examples of commercials, of videos. Tatiana, I'm so sorry, but I have to ask you to wrap up because people have been waiting for three hours and we have to make a break. We still have one question. So please wrap up with this case and we have to finish. Thank you. Just three sentences and I'm ready. Just for you to understand what was the essence, what was the essence of the violation. So the government referred to two arguments to justify the call. First, traditional role of mother in raising children. The European court said that we cannot refer to traditions and stereotypes regarding the traditional role of mother in the modern society. Because gender equality is one of the values of uh, the Council of Europe. And the second argument of government was a special role of a military, of a serviceman. Uh, the European court said, yes, uh, such an argument might be relevant, but uh, the measures taken uh, should be proportionate. And uh, since all the servicemen, service persons, All the service, uh, service persons should be able to get this uh, parental leave. If a person uh, had been in a unique position, this might have been a justification. But this man worked in the, uh, in the uh, radio intelligence unit. His colleagues were women and women, his colleagues, in such a situation, would have received this leave. And uh, the court made a decision that this was uh, the violation of the 14th article. This is a very logical end of the story. And Tatiana Martinuk asks you, the military service, uh, the mandatory military service for men, is it discrimination of men or women, or is it something else? No. We're willing to get very simple answers to difficult questions. Our constitution says that it is not a discrimination. The military service is the constitutional duty of men at the same time we realize that gender standards are closely related with cultural standards let's take israel or norway if i'm not mistaken military service is a mandatory for both men and women and the society is there anything wrong about that that's an example of legislation. Ukrainian legislation prohibited until recently to occupy a lot of military positions. But again, under the pressure of uh, gender mainstreaming, the legislation has been changed because 
women were willing to occupy military positions. They are not willing just to be cooks, chefs or housekeepers. Thank you very much, Tatiana. By your report, we are ready to finalize this session. We learned about the algorithm for identification of discriminative actions. Mr. Tatiana talked about that. Then we also learned about uh, the standards and criteria of non-discriminative advertising described by Ms. Olena and Ms. Irina. Thank you very much. Now we're going to have a 10-minute break. Let's meet again at 10 minutes to 2. And now let's watch videos. We announced the opening of the International Forum for Business, Karma, Corporate Practices on Gender Equality and Preventing Domestic Violence. proud that together we were able to provide support to over 42,000 survivors of gender-based violence in 2019 and I hope that with your support also we can continue to reach out to even more survivors and more people at risk in 2020. За дослідження фондового галузі народи населення було проведено з використання міжнародної методології Сабанчо Університету Туреччина додаванням компонентів щодо корпоративних практик у відповідь на домашні обов'язки співробітника співробітниці. 80% of consumer purchase decisions are made by women and over 60% of the global talent is now women. Over 60% of new grads coming out of university are female. So if businesses are not taking advantage of that talent and that potential consumer base, then they're going to miss out on financial opportunities for markets and talent. Сьогодні більше 10 компаній та дві бізнес-спільноти підписали декларацію за для гендерної рівності та запобігання домашньому насильству. Ми запрошуємо всі інші компанії приєднатись до нашої декларації та до досягнення цілей 5 гендерна рівність та цілі номер 8 це гідні робочі місця. 45 39 different brands in accord. We started with domestic violence because in Turkey the domestic violence percentage is very high because these are the women who left, who escaped from their house with their dresses, with their underwear even. They don't have anything with them. Violence is a very sensitive issue and topic and the, the victims are ashamed, half of the victims are ashamed to talk about their issues in the workplace. Vodafone established a policy uh, and announced that, his, uh, that Vodafone is going to implement a domestic violence policy in global level in, in every country that, that operates and supports the, its employees. The policy we launched at uh, last March on Women's Day, International Women's Day actually. So basically uh, we give uh, extra 10 days paid leave to uh, victims actually and two days paid leave to the colleagues who is going to support their colleagues, the, the victims. Это здорово. Наши дети, наше поколение, они уже будут по-другому воспринимать. Именно потому, что мы сегодня это так подаем. Отовсюду и много. Я 
вот просто вообще родителей разделил не по половому признаку, а по адекватности. То есть адекватные... Тут адекватные и неадекватные? Нет. Как а более... если оба адекватные, вот, любая неадекватная? Вот, правильно. Если оба адекватные, то тогда не будет у отца вот такого там, та, это она должна, там, пусть делает. Возможно, я не прав. Вот, и вы меня исправите. Но я считаю, что э, э, залог э, э, хорошего, там, правильного, скажем так, долголетнего супружества, вот, как родительство в партнерстве, вот, в полноценном и порнопорном, и полноправном партнерстве. Даже спорить не буду. Это 50 на 50. Но это должно быть тогда 50-50 во всех смыслах и во всех отношениях. А не тогда, когда кому-то выгодно, здесь мы 50 на 50, а вот здесь вот, извините, как бы ведь я мальчик, вот или там, а я девочка, вот поэтому мы здесь там 50 на 50 не можем. То есть если это действительно полноправное партнерство без юлений, вот, то тогда все будет хорошо. То есть тогда и ответственность делится 50 на 50, тогда и время, которое вы тратите, допустим, на собственную карьеру, оно делится там как-то 50 на 50. И время с детьми, то есть я не беру какие-то там отступления, там кратковременные, фрагментарные, когда, допустим, там вот две недели Ваш прошло. Ваш работает? Да. Это отлично. То есть вы разрешаете, или как вы как это позиционируете, что это вы ей разрешили, или это ее Нет, выбор? конечно, это ее выбор. Это чудес. Потому что Нет. многие считают, что это вот я с ней зашел, мужчина, и дал ей Вау. право работать. Нет, слушайте, это рабство. Угу. Это, это какое-то рабство в 2018 году, если такое происходит. Увы, мир такой. Но, опять-таки, если такое происходит, вы знаете, кто в этом виноват? Кто? Конечно, женщина. Как же? Потому что она позволила. Потому ага. что она позволила с собой так поступить. А как она должна поступить, не позволив? Вот он говорит, нет, ты будешь дома сидеть борщи а, варить. Ну, она должна сказать, я не хочу сидеть дома и варить борщи. Мне это не интересно. У меня есть свои интересы. Пошла вон. Хорошо. То есть нормально. Да, да, нет, она может остаться с ним и быть несчастной до конца жизни. Но давайте выбираем, как бы, если не хватит смелости и не хватит храбрости. И она с двумя детьми идет куда? А уже с двумя? Допустим. То есть, как бы до двух детей она не смогла понять, что ему надо от нее только К борщи. бывает и так. Я сталкиваюсь в своей жизни с большим количеством женщин, которым приходится очень долго разбираться в этом. Да, они могут... Опять-таки, право на ошибку мы оставляем за человека. Нет, нет, естественно, оставляем. Естественно, вот, оставляем. вот она ошиблась, у нее уже двое детей, а, ну, они маленькие. Тогда смотрите... Ну, Или он мне кажется, мимикрировал, надо... он был нет. таким Правильно. хорошим, понимающим, такие а потом раз и изменился, говорит, нет, я вообще планировал, что ты будешь сидеть дома, не работать и что дальше. Красавчик. А ему какой смысл жить с несчастливой женщиной, мне просто интересно. Это очень часто бывает нет, как а... патологическая такая. Вот, а, ну, то есть он да, просто болен. Такой. Есть такая фраза, которую Дарвин сказал, ну вроде как ее Дарвину приписывают, да, о том, что труд превратил обезьяну в человека. Вот, так вот, а вот отсутствие труда, отсутствие там, социализации, да, общения с людьми, там, а, какого-то наличия там, какого-то дела да, в твоей жизни, если то дело, которым ты занимаешься сейчас, а именно варить борщи и заниматься детьми, не приносит тебе удовольствия, вот это очень важно подчеркнуть, потому что если тебе это приносит удовольствие, ну так что ж тогда там класс, ты нашла свое призвание. Но если ты это делаешь через не хочу и через не могу, вот, то в конце концов... Твой муж придет к тебе спустя какое-то время и скажет, слушай, ты такая тупая стала, вот ты вообще превратилась в обезьяну, мне и, кажется. И такие... А у меня вот как раз на работе, на работе. Зиночка. Зиночка, ну, это, ну да, пусть будет Зиночка, но вот не очень распространенное имя, а она такая, понимаешь, вот прям вообще, она одна, да, как бы ты-то что, на мои деньги живешь? Вот она одна, она такая прямо она такая целеустремленная, она умная, с ней есть о чем поговорить, понимаешь, она понимает меня про обычных вопросов. Но что делать меня... женщине в этой ситуации? Нет, этой женщине в этой ситуации уже ничего не делать. Как? Все, умирать ложится? Нет, ну не умирать, конечно. Что? Вот, ну, во-первых, прийти к вам. Потому что она сама, приходит. смотрите, сама она не выгребет. Согласна. Вот, не вынесет согласна. вообще никак. Что очень важно, не бояться бросить о помощи. У, да. у любого человека есть кто-то, друзья, товарищи, там какие-то, ну, родители все-таки есть. То есть важно пройти через осознание, что мне плохо. И в этом может, кстати, помочь именно психолог, потому что реально человек очень иногда, он бывает созависимым, сложно понять, что ему 
ну, некомфортно. То есть это нужно проявить, ну, как пленку проявить. Uh -huh. И в этой ситуации надо не бояться просить о помощи, потому что одному человеку очень сложно справиться. Действительно, вот я всегда говорю, вы можете посоветовать ей уйти и, и от э, мужа, да, но вы лично примете к себе пожить на месяц женщину с двумя детьми. Если, если э, подруга жалуется на мужа, там какой он такой секой. Мы как бы не знаем, какая у него задача, да? Мы не знаем, какие цели она преследует. Может, она пришла к подруге как к психологу просто выговориться. Вот поэтому подруга, конечно, должна ее выслушать и сказать: да ты права, да ты права. Вот он такой секой и всякое такое. Вот если подруга ее спрашивает: так что мне делать? Слушай, ну вот я там хочу уходить. Мне уходить? Вот умная подруга. И я очень хочу, чтобы нас услышали зрители. Никогда не даст такой совет. Она должна сказать: слушай. Я не знаю, ты должна решить сама. Well, tell. Sorry, I do not know that's your decision. And I don't think that in this situation this will be the end of their friendship. Dear participants, Hopefully you've had enough time to rest and you are back because now we're going to have a very festive event. This is a sign of progress. You have just watched the video. In this video a declaration was signed. And we would like more companies to sign this declaration, the declaration on uh, fighting domestic violence. Let me remind you of the declaration the companies sign. Until 2025, uh, the gender-sensitive approaches should be implemented in uh, the activities of companies, creating equal opportunities for uh, work and family-friendly uh, policy. Then another goal is uh, fighting the domestic violence and uh, zero tolerance to all its manifestations. And then fight for empowerment of women and intolerance of domestic violence. That's what the declaration is about. And let me remind you that we have already 14 signees and Right now, some other companies and even business associations are going to join this declaration. The European Business Association will be the first to sign it. Okay, actually, they were really willing to sign it. They uh, unfortunately do not have uh, opportunity to uh, join our webinar, but they said that they are very eager to sign the declaration and implement it. Then, next, a very cool company, Kernel, is going to sign the declaration. This is uh, the HR department head of this company, Natalia, hello. Good afternoon, thank you very much for this opportunity. This uh, declaration on gender equality and uh, combating gen uh, domestic violence is very important for us. Our company runs business in Ukraine and we are interested not only in financial performance but also in long-term and sustainable development of the country. The gender equality and cultural diversity opens a big potential for our business and other businesses. Um, the more people have equal rights and equal access to different positions, development, working terms, the more opportunities our country will have. At the moment, we have uh, the approved rules on gender equality. We have uh, a code of ethics which uh, eliminates all kinds of uh, harassment and violence toward our employees. We've got a hotline which any employees may use to report any of the cases. 
we also implement the policy on gender equality and the cultural diversity. According to this policy, all the employees have the right to their own visions and beliefs irrespective of their age, gender, status and so on. So these rules were adopted at about a year ago and we follow them. And signing this declaration is another chance for us. It will help us to make progress. We are a leading company in agribusiness. Our actions are important for the entire Ukrainian agribusiness, agricultural business. We are really eager to sign it and we hope we will become a role model for other companies. Natalia, could you sign it now and show us? I'm really sorry. I failed to print the declaration out because I work from home remotely, but definitely we will sign the declaration and uh, you have my word, the obligations, uh, the commitments are very important for us, we are going to comply with them. Of course, we had no doubts. I think uh, your example will be inspirational for other companies. And now I would like to ask uh, a public company, a state-owned company, to sign this declaration. This is Olga Lepchenko representing the company. Good afternoon, everyone. We are market operator, we are a gender balanced enterprise and we eagerly supported the initiative launched by the UNFPA, British Embassy and uh, the uh, center. Today we signed the declaration electric uh, um, electricity uh, or energy market has always been considered as uh, um, male occupation, but uh, the experience showed that it might be also interesting for women. 60% of our employees are women and many women occupy also top management positions. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, we uh, as the market operator, as uh, a European level uh, company uh, should comply with the uh, uh, the European or in global principles. So thank you for raising such an important topic. We have signed the declaration and we will send it to you in the nearest future. Please show it closer. Lift it. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So we see the signature. Uh, yes. A round of applause from everyone watching. And the previous saying is, I'm sure that uh, uh, the Sainese, other Sainese are always also glad to see other companies joining. The next company uh, will be a bank, Ukraxim Bank. And this is uh, Janina Olkhovska, uh, the, uh, sh the head of the corporate responsibility unit. Please, uh, a couple of words from you. Uh, good afternoon, dear Marina, dear colleagues, dear participants and the audience we are very glad to join this declaration this issue is really relevant for us we are a stable financial company and since 2009 we have been caring about gender policy um, we've got a, a policy which we implemented in 2012. This is a policy on preventing harassment. Since 2017, Jean-Laurent Bonafé, the president, signed the Declaration on Gender Equality and cultural diversity. It was done in the headquarters of the UN. Several activities were launched after signing this policy. 
to take the necessary steps. We, as a part of the group, have already implemented several measures in 2019. We launched a specialized program for women, women entrepreneurs, women in business. It was a, a very successful program. And this year, in spite of the virus, in spite of the crisis, we will continue this program. Speaking about our girls, we've got 67% of uh, uh, women and girls, and we've got 59% of women occupying managing positions. We have also a so-called women club. We've got a centralized program of uh, leaders for tomorrow. We have already signed the declaration. Let me show you the signature. It's here. We are working in a distance manner, remotely, and I currently work at the branch of the bank. This declaration was signed by uh, Andrei Vishmeruk, and we have passed you this copy of declaration. Thank you very much. It's so cool that uh, an international bank like yours joined the declaration. Oh, we know that you are always supportive of these progressive ideas. The next company is Danone Ukraine. Unfortunately, they failed to join us, but due to the technical opportunities, they shot a short video. We will see it on the screen. And uh, uh, we will have a speech by uh, the HR uh, department head. So you, you, you have just watched the process of signing the declaration. Uh, so they did it. I think that they deserved a round of applause again. Then the next the next signee is a very interesting company, one of my favorites. This is a, this is an association in charge of managing changes. I know that at a conference in December, you were very supportive of our initiatives and now you have finally joined the declaration. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to join this initiative and sign this declaration on the gender equality and combating domestic violence. The uh, Association of uh, Change Managers in Ukraine is uh, uh, part of uh, SMP Global based in the US. Their uh, duty is to prevent domestic violence. Uh, then the preventing domestic violence is a standard for the private life and for business in America. Uh, therefore, we are very interested in uh, making these changes happen in our company as well as in our community. Lots of uh, Ukrainian companies, representatives of Ukrainian companies uh, make the part of this community and at our events that we plan to inform them about this very important aspect of gender equality, namely prevention of domestic violence in their company, because uh, this has an impact on uh, the success of transformation in companies and success of changes taking place in their companies. We will do our best to support them. We have signed the declaration, so you see, this is our copy with my signature. Thank you very much once again for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really need to get some advices from the change management specialists on how to integrate. Uh, how to integrate these processes, these approaches for gender equality and domestic violence prevention. Your expertise will be really, really, really important. And uh, thank you again. One more signatory. 
today uh, this company has already presented their model their approach and we definitely know that they paved the way they are in this movement they completely stick to the declaration principles for expo Anna <laughs> welcome again so please do sign well I'm glad to say again we've already signed the document the head of the board please take a closer look at that so we can scan it we're ready to do it and send it it's quite an honor for us to be uh, the first company from the uh from this industry actually actually to be involved in that process thank you for doing that we're so grateful from on behalf of the UNFPA this is their initiative actually the initiative of Pavloza Mostyan Natalia Koshovska they in, were inspired with this in, in uh, the Germany so Turkey actually joined us and right now we have 20 signatories already And thank you so much. Thank you so much on behalf of the UNFP. Thank you so much. I express my gratitude for that and to our partners. Svetlana Publish, as the head of the series. Svetlana Publish, special gratitude to you again, because we now have more <laughs> of those involved and we've only have the beginning. So dear participants, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear viewers, I don't know if you liked actually this online uh, mode, but I do hope that maybe I do hope that you got something you wanted to get. Please, please, uh, under under the stream, uh, right on our Facebook page, maybe something else to be improved, some extra recommendations, maybe some questions we did not stick to. What UNFPA maybe should do, what further steps should be taken. So this would be the feedback, you know, for us. But I'd like to draw the line, to find a line, just to draw the conclusion and what we talked today. So we talked about national framework, what it is. We talked about the practices of the companies in the context of internal policies. And also external policies were mentioned. Of course, the uh, non-discriminatory communication and advertising. And also we saw the signatories. We saw those people who actually put the signatures, who showed us the declarations. And those will be sent to the fund. So, if we still have some companies who'd like to join us, we have Anastasia Krashevska, representative uh, of the UNFPA in Ukraine. So, please do refer to Anastasia, and we will be so glad to welcome you in our family of signatories, in our big family. Secondly, if you're only thinking about what to start with, uh, I think uh, very nice recommendations were given. For example, start with simple mathematics. Compare the number of men and women and ask yourself why something's wrong. Or maybe everything is okay. Then you need to stay with us even more. Then, if you calculate, if you see that something can be done, please, something else can be done, please take the 4B model, 4-step model. Everything is there. This is like a guidance. This is like a guidance for the company to start implementing the policies of gender equality in domestic violence, combating and elimination. So, of course, of course. The representatives of your company, uh, the employees, to familiarize with the practices, to familiarize with the presentations from this webinar, and maybe to send a request for the publication of the 4B model because UNFPA printed that and you can order these. So, we start from calculation and we go on to uh, such a definition. And we go further. So maybe you actually can do it as another step. So I'm so grateful to you. Maybe it's important to add, so please take care of your employees. Don't forget. Because we do have another reason. Maybe certain depression, a certain stress due to the situation that we face right now, please. Their mental health. And please, 
Stay healthy. Stay at home. And I want us to see face to face <laughs> and to see all the signatories in person, all those who fight for gender equality. Again, huge gratitude to you and FPA for doing that. Huge gratitude to our partners. Embassy of UK in Ukraine and Svetlana published. Huge gratitude to you as well. Thank you.